barely function here because of a mouse. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. If I go like this, does it make a loud sound? If I go. No, now it's muted. But does that make a loud sound? No, actually, you would think it would. Usually, when you're tapping the Yeti at all, it's so sensitive it picks everything up, but it's pretty good. Is that a new one, or I wonder if they've made the changes to them? I don't know. Somebody gave it to me, and they haven't asked for Hopefully, they <laughs> asked for it back. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Yeah, that's handy, handy mic. Okay, I'm ready finally. Okay. All right, we've got Blaze Kennedy with us tonight. He's a somatic therapist from the beautiful British Columbia. He's not too far away, probably about five or six hour drive through the mountains. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, healing through awareness and consciousness and all kinds of good stuff. Can you just say the the British Columbia? Is it a what? Is that, it's beautiful British Columbia. Is that yeah. what they taught you too? Do they the same teacher? What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with that? I don't know. Isn't that like saying the Alberta? I don't know. It's okay. What do you think, Blaze? We we frozen up. Yeah, I'm back. I'm back. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Talking about beautiful British Columbia, where I'm. Born and raised. There you go. Yeah, me too. So, how are you doing in the mountains, snowy mountains, right now? Well, we, my wife and I, moved here uh, maybe six years ago, and it was a place to go for many reasons. It was wholesome. And it's connected to nature. We needed a place to go, but it's also a place to go when uh, the modern world seems to be more unstable, and uh, that choice is looking. Uh, really good right now so we're tucked away and we have you know a wonderful community here of people that are um see the world the way that we do and wow we love we love to be where we are so it's a it's a really beautiful place and i have two young children and we are when i look out my window i see the river i see the mountains and uh yeah this place has been very good to me that's great. I read your email that you sent me and looked at your website and all. I'm looking forward to discussing the important topic of how to access consciousness and all that. But I do think, you know, even though you put your your story down at the bottom of the priority list, I think it would be appropriate to start there probably. I, you probably don't like talking to yourself, about yourself, I mean, like me. But I think it's worth it. Let's, let's, let's talk about how you kind of got into this a little bit. I mean, quite simply, I got into this because I it was kind of cornered in my life. I normally people kind of live with a standard connection to consciousness and they're able to move about their life and get things done and achieve their goals and have healthy relationships. But I, I wasn't able really to do any of that. Um, the, the major turning point in my life, I think was when my, my father died unexpectedly when I was 12. Um, and as a teenager, I had no, there was no context for what that meant for me in terms of my trauma or my life. And I just tried to carry on with my life. And um, I wasn't really functional. I continued to actually lose functionality. I got involved with drugs. Um, and the question forever in my family and in my world was, what's wrong with you? You know, you have so much potential. Why can't you, why can't you, uh, access that and I had no idea and um you know I tried I tried everything I just tried going back to school I for a while I decided I wanted to be a professional pool player I tried to be involved in certain you know relationships that would get me <clears throat> get me through it and no matter really what I did I kind of came back to the same place I just kind of kept collapsing or failing I couldn't hold it together um and you know, for me now, I see this as a tremendous grace. It was very lucky. I feel very fortunate. But at the time, I felt miserable. Like there was this, there was something really wrong with me, and um, I wasn't able to fix it. I mean, and that's also the good news is that there, I wasn't able to fix it. It made me open to other possibilities. I actually kind of got forced into that. I got sent to a treatment facility, 
and um, for, for drug addiction. And what they, what they basically uh, supported me to do was to learn how to tell the truth and to, and to feel myself yeah. and to be honest about my thoughts and feelings and what I'd been through. And that's really the only thing I hadn't tried. <laughs> you know, I tried moving forward in my life. I tried, <clears throat> you know, picking up a new hobby or sort of painting another coat on a kind of a rusty ship. But uh, I never really tried going backwards. <clears throat> I never tried really examining what was going on for me. And I, when I was in treatment, I, I remember loving it. Like, I, I think I fell in love. It was, it was really clear that I'd... Um, you know, I found something that was both going to work for me and that um, I was really interested in. You know, I took psychology in university, funny enough, and obviously that didn't help me very much. But when I started to actually be a patient to myself, when I started to do my own research about myself, I sort of fell in love with it. And, you know, after years of being stuck and really not knowing what I could do differently, and um, I just became very excited about the possibility of being able to have power, personal power, and change my life. I felt that I was very good at um, being in treatment, which is essentially sharing your feelings, being in group therapy, talking a lot about the challenges you've been through. And when I got out of treatment, I, you know, there, there are all these other people in, in treatment who want to get back to their lives. And, you know, they're like, I have a company to run. I have kids. They're in the middle of their lives. But I didn't have a life. I didn't really have anything to go back to. Um, and then, so I just decided this was going to be my life. And, you know, recovery specifically, like Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous, wasn't really, it was tremendously helpful for me. And that's what the, the program that the uh, treatment center was founded on. But I just sort of knew that I was going to get into spirituality. I didn't know what that meant, really. I had no... You know, it wasn't talked about in my childhood or it wasn't subject in school. Um, so I kind of had to go about finding my way through it. And I started meditating a lot. I spent, uh, uh, I, I started getting really into meditation. I used to listen to this teacher, uh, Jay Krishnamurti, who basically, I, I couldn't really understand what he was saying, but what I came out of it with is I should just sit still, <laughs> do anything for periods of time. Yeah. Um, don't try to do anything fancy. Don't just sit there. Yeah. And, and I did that for a while. I was, I was really into it. So I had a kind of a natural draw to it. So um, after a couple of years of uh, being in recovery, after two years, I, I, had a, I had a kind of a next level being ready for me. A package deal. I met my wife and she was into spirituality and she was actively... Uh, aware of all sort of all the spiritual teachers and then my wife came into my life and she uh, right away she bought me tickets to meet uh, to a to a, a workshop of this one teacher she had carried books of the other in my in, with her when she moved into my house and she actually picked the Slocan Valley it was a, a full package of a life um, and I remember I I went to see uh, my there are two spiritual teachers who really had an impact on me. And one of them, I went to his work in, in, at UBC, and um, he's from Germany. His name's Thomas Hubel. And I looked at him, and I remember thinking to myself, this is the first person I've ever seen in my life who really knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. just, just I looked at him, and I knew. He knew. And I decided that this is – I was going whatever he told me to do is what I was going to do. And so um, he – in, in terms of consciousness or spirituality, he had one particular focus. And I'll talk a little bit more about that is how I sort of break down consciousness. But he really emphasized, you could say, healing or looking at our trauma. And he had a tremendous ability to see people, uh, what they were carrying. Uh, and he, I remember one time I, I put my hand up to look at him. Mm -hmm. And it was as if I'd put the, the ring from Lord of the Rings on and the eye had just turned to me and I was... <laughs> Just like I've, I became transparent, and this person could see right through me, and I was—I couldn't figure out how that was possible. I remember I was shaking, and uh, he sort of—he, uh, he, yeah, he saw right through me, and I thought, "Wow, this is this is the kind of power and intelligence that I want to apply myself to. This is what I want to spend my time doing." So you know, I, I went to—I ended up going to San Francisco to see him again. But really, I was 
I knew that I didn't, I was just going to go out and do what he said. He gave me very simple instructions and uh, I just went and applied those. The other teacher that was really important to me is also, um, he's from California, his name's Adi Ashanti, and he teaches the other end of the spectrum. He's not so interested in um, healing specifically, at least that's not the doorway that he he gets people to go through. He really, his emphasis on consciousness and as a sort of uh, experience in totality. And he comes from a from Zen Buddhism originally and uses a practice called self-inquiry. So, you know, I had I had my wife, I had this, and she she was my wife now, and uh, we had this life path together of, of traveling and moving here, and I had two sort of teachers with their sort of basic outlook that were helpful, and I just got to it. I just lived my life from a different point of view with a, a really small shift in how I did things that made a tremendous difference. And... <clears throat> um, yeah, I can I could talk about you know more about the experiences I've had specifically, but I'll just um, I'll leave some space for you there. If yeah, you sure. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's it's very similar to the experience I had in treatment too. I was shunted over to treatment, you know, tw- in two thousand and eight. I loved it there. I was just embracing the spiritual part of it. The honesty part was the most freeing aspect, like realizing that I have been lying to myself, and I had this reflex of making excuses and justifications and once I started to be aware of that and realize like I don't need to <clears throat> please anybody or or pretend I'm supposed to be somewhere else or whatever just just uh that was the free the most freeing part was the honesty part of it so so it must have been good seeing you know meeting those teachers and then that self inquiry you're talking about which you've already been used to doing after a couple of years in treatment I mean you know well, treatment was a huge advantage because, I mean, you know, you know what it's like. Is it's like, especially AA meetings are like uh, people just coming over the top to be honest about the most intense stuff. Yeah. Right, and you just get used to a kind of ethic where they, you know, they you're used to you just you just say and do and admit to and feel yeah. very difficult things, and you get a lot out of it. And so this ethic of recovery, the kind of intensity or rawness of it, was extremely useful to me. You know, yeah. because but when I met these teachers and they were talking about, you know, specifically about trauma, I was like, you know, I'm, I, I know what it's like to to hustle like that. You know, they in treatment, they give you a kind of a work ethic. They, they teach you how to use the truth or honesty as a kind of a work yeah. as activity. And so absolutely, that was very, very useful. And it's interesting to hear people for... Like we're part of these other groups of podcasts and all all that right now, and it surprises me how many people have been through addiction and and are opening up to different sort of realities and talking about it. It shocks me how many people. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess let's, uh, Darren. Do you have any questions about about that or? Well, you you mentioned it was uh, some small sort of changes in consciousness. Can you kind of elaborate on what those might what those look like? Because that's kind of thing a lot of people are missing is that you know if you just p- change your perception a little bit, shit doesn't seem so bad. Right. Well, it so there was a one big shift that um, that started kind of like a house fire. You know, a house fire starts with some flames or some big moment and, and continues. And so the first big moment I ever had ended up um, creating a lot of waves in my life for a long time up until right now. Um, and so at the time, and I'll speak to what I sort of experienced and, and why, I couldn't really explain. I couldn't talk about consciousness. It was just really clear that something had happened to me. And I spent a lot of time... Um, in a kind of a personal process that has allowed me to speak more clearly about consciousness. But with everybody, when they start, th- we all know that we have consciousness, but it, it's very difficult for any sort of person who hasn't been through a process to say clearly what it is from their experience. It's kind of out of focus. It's kind of, it feels like something that's happening, but you know, w- what does it actually mean for consciousness? So people, as you're saying, you know, if we recognize, if we turn to consciousness, what effect is it going to have on my life? Why would that help 
benefit me well i was i wasn't really i didn't need to know that at the time i was just all in i'll talk a little later about how i think it can create change in your life how i see it now but i was given a book uh, from this teacher Adi shanti and his method is called self-inquiry and it's a very ancient and direct way of looking at consciousness and it's called self-inquiry because what you do is you is you say what is it or who is it that is having this experience and you can eliminate anything that's changing so you know my thought is my thoughts are not continuous they change they stop and go and there's a sort of a flow of thoughts but they're always changing so i can't be my thoughts well, i can't be my feelings either because they're changing all the time i can't be my uh, my body sensations because they're changing all the time so it's this kind of uh, curiosity about this sense of self and for the listeners we're going to do an activity around this at the end um, because this is this is uh, really important i think it's the foundation of consciousness is the sense of self um, and i was reading this book and his method and it kind of made sense but not really you know i when he says um um, who is it that is having this experience? I was looking and I wasn't really sure. And I was actually walking under the Burrard Street Bridge and just randomly walking along. And I had a very uh, str strong sort of answer to that. I had a, it felt like I actually got hit in the head with um, uh, like a lightning bolt or something like that. There was this very strong experience in my forehead. And I sort of sat. Kind of where, if you know where the the little ferries are, yeah, little... under under the Bar Barge Street Bridge in the False Creek there, yeah, like a boat ferry, right? Yeah, no, like, yeah. Ferry like ferry. <laughs> well, there might have been other ferries too, but <laughs> and you know there was there was a, there was energy in my body, there was all sorts of movement, and I, I knew something was happening, but I didn't know what it was. But what came out of it was a sense of wherever I looked. I remember I looked all across false creek the things that previously were over there sort of outside you know there's we have this experience of all these things being outside our body there was nothing outside anymore everywhere i looked there was this inside quality and it made life really beautiful it made life tremendously beautiful and i couldn't again i couldn't tell you the time what that meant but just everything was here and it was very clear and very alive and very rich. And I actually got on one of the ferries and I was just, I was just overjoyed. I was I'd never been happier in my life. And as I got to the other side, I, I got off the ferry under the dock at, uh, at the market. And I said, I don't want this to ever stop. I, I want to, I want to stay like this forever. And it left. <laughs> and, and, but it was enough, like even, even beyond, I, I did, really didn't understand what it was, but but everything in me like uh, started to change. And I mean it when I say like a house fire, like that was a kind of a spark that just created in my in my body, in my emotions, in my mental world, in my whole experience, a kind of very continuous process of transformation. Everything reflected that. You know, some memories would come up, stuff would come up for me. I'd start to, you know, read books about spirituality and and understand elements of them consciousness was becoming sort of unveiled for me um <clears throat> and I, I probably started meditating even more um and what i would say is is that in um what i would say now is what was happening is a tremendous refocusing so that the, the body and the the emotional world everything that you call yours or, or yourself is kind of organized uh, with a level of focus. I'm going to say that for now. And it was a tremendous reorganization because consciousness for me is something that is perceived when you shift your focus. It's really a different way of looking at the same experience. So um, you can understand if you take a, uh, a camera lens or something like that, and you shift between the foreground and the background. Well, in the foreground of life, we see a sort of material world where I am separate from everything else. Everything is predominantly physical. I feel like an object, and I look around me and I see a bunch of objects out there. And this is a kind of, this is like what Newtonianism is. This is what Isaac Newton says is, is physics. And the world's been operating like this is the truth forever that we're physical objects we apply force to things 
You know, if I want to build a house, I have to hit it with a hammer. That's the world that we experience. So a shift in perception is um, really in everything inside myself, my emotions, my body, my mind, my awareness. Everything shifts, and I don't see a physical world anymore. I, just, I mean, I still perceive that this microphone is physical. If I tap on it, my hand's not going to go through it. But what ends up happening is that the dominant experience is of a fluid state of energy. And that everything looks like, appears like, a fluid state of energy inside the experience of being aware. And to have that shift is, and for me, was a, a process of refocus or reorganization. The more that I turn my attention to it, the more that my whole body moved in that direction. Um, so if you ask a question like, why, why would... Why would consciousness help? How would that help me or how would that help the world? Well, the, the really simple answer is, is for me, is that there's a second way to perceive reality. Mm. There's a second way to perceive and interact with reality in which the truth is not that we're a bunch of separate physical objects which we apply force to, but that we're part of a fluid field of energy. So if I live in a material world, I apply force to things like I would, again, if I, my, if I build a house, I have to hit it with a hammer. And so we apply force to all kinds of things in our life. Everything that force doesn't work for is a place where we feel stuck or we're in pain or something's not working. So an example of that is I can't force my feelings, right? I can't force the way I feel about something. <clears throat> I can't force somebody to agree with me. I can't force us to get along. I can't force other people to see my point of view. And we try. We have all kinds of strategies to do that. But ultimately, I have to shift my perception to an experience of consciousness and solve problems at that level. So my take on it is that we, we've moved along this sort of physical experience, and we've been tremendously successful. We build bridges. We fly airplanes all around the world. But there's this whole other level of problems that we haven't solved yet. We haven't solved how to sort of love ourselves and love each other, how to be kind, how to um, raise our children without sort of harming them, how to educate people properly in a way that has them feel grounded in their bodies. And there's all these problems we haven't solved yet. And it's because we continue, we've just been really busy at a level of focus. We've been just really engaged with the material aspect of our experience. Is that like an IQ versus EQ sort of thing on a simplified level? Sure, absolutely. So, yeah, we, are, we, we have concepts like that there's other kinds of intelligence, and we start to notice that the, the rules of those intelligences are different, right? That my emotions don't operate the intelligence of my feelings, they don't operate in the same way as my rationality. Because there's kind of a different uh, physics that's present. And if there's my, a lack of nurturing to them in Western society, especially. Absolutely. Or education about them, or, you know, most of us haven't really mastered them until you're 40. Right. It's a, it's amazing the way that our culture is set up, as we have, we educate people in a sort of um, as if they are in this physical way where the intellect is dominant because in a physical world the intellect is your best friend it's the thing that measures and uh, crafts and comes up with ideas so yeah i'm a product of that and when i you know again when my father died no one around me had any strategies or idea how to support me really my school my colleagues or my, my fellow students my parents nobody really had the skill set to see what was going on for me and offer advice. In fact, what they gave me instead was, you know, to to focus on things that I could do, right? So with the, absolutely, there's a tremendous ignorance in culture about emotion. Um, and I consider myself a kind of a, uh, my pain is a product of the fact that my culture didn't really show me a different way. Do you think that manifests physically and, you know, we also have like the sickest culture? I mean, we got all sorts of problems with, you know, vaccines and pharmaceutical medicine and diet and all sorts of other stuff. But it seems like when you look at 
I don't know, especially yeah. things like cancer, they keep coming around to this thing that, you know, you can't seem to get away from the emotional aspect of it. Absolutely. Uh, um, <clears throat> Yeah, at this point, I don't see a physical um, or a physiological um, reason that anything happens at all. I mean, I don't think any, the reason or cause of anything doesn't start in physicality for me. So we have doctors who keep looking for new molecules or uh, proteins that are causing things. I don't think things are actually caused at the physical level. So, you know, when I look at people who have cancer, they look at it sort of very one-dimensionally as you're saying they look at it as that they're having a physical illness because that's how they experience themselves they experience themselves primarily as physical but you know we can see it again it's just you're describing health is not something we've been successful to treat physically no you know allopathic interventions really are preventative they don't have a solution for preventative medicines and they don't really have a direction for wellness and so I would see that as a limitation of the physical model, which is why more people, when they get sick, they don't, they don't turn to those, uh, they don't turn to doctors to, at least in my world, uh, you know, there's lots of places where people turn to doctors. I mean, obviously, look at what's going on with, <laughs> yeah, now. But uh, I should, I should hold my tongue before I speak about that. But um, yeah, I think there's a tremendous opportunity for people to realize cause and effect, and to understand. Um, you know, a, a new a new way of perceiving why things happen and and what what those things actually are. And it doesn't have to be an either or sort of thing, right? You don't have to go all in. You can just do all that emotional stuff while you're doing the other stuff. You know, just like don't discount that fact that the more you think it's all crumbling down, the more it's all crumbling down. Right. And the the shift that I had, the refocusing that I had, didn't have me go and sit in a mountaintop and do nothing. I mean, some people that happens to, but I've had more, I've done more than I ever could before. In fact, my my life before looked like a bunch of uncompleted projects. What I would say is that once the there starts to be more flow in your emotional world and in consciousness, motivation shifts, you're able to take on a lot more challenging and rigorous projects. I've uh, I was able to move, buy a house, uh, have two children. I, I have fostered a child. I worked in foster care. I was I've been tremendously productive, the most productive years in my life. And um, none of that I could have done previously. I mean, I was I was a sort of basket case. So that once there's more of a sort of life energy in the body, it's amazing what what people can do. So yeah, I. I I am a product of not being able to create that energy to to do the things that I need to do on my own and needing to turn to consciousness as a way to become more functional, essentially. I think we're missing that as in our society growing up. The whole middle spiritual thing it doesn't have to be a religious spirituality, but we're really being we're under pressure from, you know, the materialist paradigm, really. And we don't have that. Like you were mentioning a couple kids that you knew that were scared of dying, like they had that whole death trauma thing happening. And it could be from somebody like from what's happening in society right now or they don't know what's going to happen at the end. Is it just darkness? Is that it? Is that the end? Right. But that's a pretty nihilistic way to look at things. I mean, if you go through life thinking that there's more than just physical reality, I mean, once you, which leads me to the, to the question, like once you, you're aware of this or you start to see, let's say, the extended consciousness or energy aspect of reality, does that mean that then you can start to manipulate it a little bit or not manipulate, but uh, manifest <clears throat> well, that's a new reality? You know, I don't want to use the word manipulate because that seems a bit negative, but. Uh, you absolutely can. And um, most of my focus has been kind of deconstructive. What I'm more, what I've been more concerned in myself and with people I work with is I actually believe um sort of life wants to manifest the best but we actually have things that are blocking that hmm. and um so i i actually experience a model of reality that's more like a loaded spring than uh something that needs to be sort of stoked and encouraged and a loaded spring you i mean you just you just move your hand out of the way of it right and there 
goes. I actually think we're 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 primed for success for reaching our potential. That's what everything inside of us wants to do. But for a variety of reasons, that is kind of locked or or, or a good word for that is contracted inside ourselves. And so absolutely we can focus on those things. But if, for me, the most important thing is to notice. Um, you know, if there's something I really want, am I holding it in an open way? Is it flowing through me or is it contracted? Because I can want to be uh, something great forever, but if I hold it in a kind of a negative way, in a contracted way, <clears throat> it tends to show up in my life that way. And, and so when you say hold it, you're saying hold it in your vision, hold it in your in your experience, hold it in your body, like the, in all those ways? All of those ways, yeah. Absolutely. So for me, most of the work has been to, and what I help people with most of the time, is to remove barriers to the manifestation that wants to happen. And they know it wants to happen. That's why they're frustrated in their life. You know, For me, I was growing up, I wanted to be, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I wanted to do something great. Whatever it was, I didn't really care. I just wanted to do something meaningful. I wanted to express. I wanted to live. And you know, I kept trying to do that. And it kept failing. And then essentially what I did differently is I stopped uh, trying to create something new. And I really focused on removing the barriers to that. And then the and simple things become great. Absolutely. But also the, 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 there becomes a clear, for me, there became a clear pathway to achieving what I wanted. It just kind of all made sense. Opportunities started to arise that were perfect for me, that were developmentally perfect. Co consciousness, you could say, the way of the world of seeing consciousness is, is very much about creating, but it's also about learning. And to have a shift in consciousness really means a kind of, for me, an openness, which is very uh, pro-learning. And the universe loves to teach you. Consciousness loves to teach you. And so when we talk about, you know, manifesting something along the way there, I know it's going to extract maximum learning value for you. And so there's a kind of, uh, for me, there's a kind of intelligence to know that's where I'm going. And along the way, I'm going to have to keep learning about myself to refine um, so that by the time I get there, uh, I'm ready for it. So then I'm, I'm maturing as I go along. You know, I, I decided when I was in treatment, I just knew I was going to be a spiritual teacher. But the path to doing that has taken me forever and required me to be um, tremendously honest and clear about what I'm doing. And um, so if we want to manifest something really wonderful, you know, one way to think about it is we have a lot of responsibility. And I think life looks to match our responsibility with uh, with teaching and learning. So how do you, how do we, especially now with what's going on? I mean, I've been on an emotional roller coaster. I'm sure everybody is with, with what's happening in the world. I mean, it is pretty difficult to deal with all this. Like how do we shift our consciousness in these times and how can that help us get through this collective trauma or, or I mean, or what, I mean, I don't even know what the question should be. Like what, you know, do we, <laughs> I don't know if people even want to to see a different reality right now. I mean, it's a scary. If you, it's scary if you see a different reality right now. Yeah, and I mean, your listeners and you guys are you are people who represent being willing to see how the world actually is. Whether we're all accurate about that or not is not really important. Whether we know the right stories, but we're willing. That's why people listen to your show. Is because they're willing to see that there is, there's a kind of a either a dark side or a bright side that they can't see. Yeah. Both. And so I'm assuming that everybody who's listening to this is on board to that to some degree. The question is, um, you know, as you say, where do we look? How do we get started? Like, where do you resist? Where do you go with the flow? I mean, where do you? When do you stand up, or do you just disengage? I mean, these are all the questions that that I'm struggling with personally, like when, when, you know, how much do you prepare for, you know, moving yeah. to a, moving to a, a more isolated place? Or is that something, or do you just prepare yourself for a couple years of, of letting go and hunkering down and, and seeing how everything washes out, you know? Right. So, I mean, there's in the, in the occupation that I do, 
I'm aware that there are many people who have strong opinions about what's coming next. They, for a variety of reasons, whether they refer to the Bible or whether they have their own ins personal insight, you know, everybody would like to chime in about, many people would like to chime in about what the next thing is that's going to happen. And frankly, I don't know. I think that there are some rules. I think that there are some <coughs> principles that I could suggest are going to happen. And, um, you know, so I certainly can't tell you where to live or... No, what, yeah. But um, I, guess I guess to discern, to discern, like, how do we go within and discern what is, what is, uh, I mean, maybe that's a start, right? Discerning the truth or what is not true maybe is better. Right. So let's just, let's just jump into a little bit. Let's not even wait to the end if you guys are okay with it. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. It's experiential because I could talk about this a lot, but my favorite thing really is to show people. And then once you get, a hang of what I'm talking about, then we can have a different conversation. I don't just have to talk about consciousness, but we can actually look at how it functions and how it feels. So we're going to do a little uh, exercise. And uh, with you two guys, I will use you as my, uh, we'll do it relationally. So I'll ask you questions and then you can tell me what your experience is. So I'm going to say, and of course the listeners, I would love for you to follow along and take this Take this in as much as you can and participate along. So I'm going to say that life is five things. Your life is five things. You see things. You hear things. You think things. You feel emotions. And you feel body sensations. Right? That's your life. And we're going to do a little exercise to refocus the way we experience all of these things. We're going to... We're going to do the, the very radical act of recognizing awareness as a pure and open experience that is all-encompassing. So we can start with just with our vision. Um, Graham, you can just name some of the things that you can see. Window. <laughs> Any more? Why is this? Why is, why is it so funny? No, I'm just, I'm just having had nothing funny about this. Okay, thing. okay. It's a window. Just usually people say two or three things. And I just oh. or the, the one window. <laughs> um, you and uh, a light. Great. So when we when we talk about when I say that there's a physical way to perceive life, notice that what Graham's doing is he's perceiving objects that exist over here and over there. And there's, there's me, and there's the window, and there's the light, and there's all these different things. And we're just going to relax our focus. So, Graham, what I want you to do is just um, notice that you can see these things. And I would say the reason that you can see them is because you have awareness. If there was no awareness, you wouldn't be able to see them. Okay. And I want you, instead of describing the things, I want you to describe awareness. Just see what happens when you look to capture and describe awareness. What happens? That's separate. Great. Great start. What qualities does it have? What qualities does this separate thing have? Calm, actually. I mean, just the act of trying to become aware or see the awareness seems to relax. Right. Absolutely. So when I look at the window or the me, I'm, we could say that you're perceiving information, stuff, objects, energy, whatever you want to call it, information. When you look at awareness, what would you describe that as? It's not stuff really, is it? It's no, it's a, just, it's just a, uh, an energy maybe. Right. A calm Maybe a sense of emptiness or blankness. Would you describe it like that? Yeah. Okay. So, um, Darren, if we follow along, you can, I know you're wearing headphones, but just name some of the things that you can hear. Obviously. You can hear the furnace kicking in. Great. You can hear my voice. I can hear your soothing voice. <laughs> Wonderful. And the same way, you can you can tune in, you can focus on different things that you were hearing in different places. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to go, 
I'm hearing things. I must be aware of them. If I didn't have awareness, I wouldn't be able to hear them. And I want you to describe awareness. First thing we notice is that awareness is not a sound. What is it? Like a field um, of influence. Can you say more about that? Well, it's just kind of like everything within my bubble or my sphere that is able to, that I'm able to discern or categorize. Right. So what you're saying is that when you look for awareness, you, you become aware of a sense of a, of a bubble of experience. Is that right? Yeah. Or more of a field field because they can cross, cross each other and stuff like that. Yeah. It's... Right. And so it, would you say awareness is not a sound? Does that sound true? Yes. Great. So I would say I hear noises. I hear my voice, my, my soothing voice, or however it is to you listeners. And the furnace, awareness to me is like a silence. It's like a receptive silence. An empty space, quiet. And without Blaze's voice changing or the furnace stopping, now I'm aware of silence. I'm aware of a kind of empty silence. And uh, Graham, if we come back to you, we can do the same thing with your thoughts. You don't have to share your thoughts on uh, streaming radio right now. I will, but you notice that you have thoughts and you can connect with them, right? And we're going to do the same thing. I'm having thoughts. I must be aware of them. That's why I can hear them. And I turn my attention to awareness itself. And how is awareness different from a thought? It's... Uh... It's um, observative. <clears throat> Great. Absolutely. Right. If that's a word. It's not. You know what I mean, though? It's not. <laughs> all kinds of observational. People. It might be. I mean, you went to a different <laughs> school than me. So, I mean, <laughs> clearly you guys have different rules. <laughs> they have all kinds of fancy terms for it in, in Eastern religions, but they, the observer yeah. is what they call it. They would call it the observer or they call it the witness. Yeah. There's a sense like I'm detached, I'm witnessing life. Yeah. yeah. Is that the is that the same like analogy of when you tell someone to like, you know, what are you thinking about or whatever? And they're like, Well, I'm thinking about this. And then you're like, Well, is that you? And they're like, Well, yeah. And then you're like, Well, who's listening? Exactly, there? exactly. That's exactly what so when you were talking earlier about the awareness and how you I was thinking back to the mindfulness, you know, the Buddhist mindfulness meditation that really flipped a switch in me and i remember lying on the couch and doing it and it was that point when it's like i'm not my thoughts when i started to be able to watch my thoughts that i'm not those thoughts i'm aware i'm separate from my thoughts it's not me i'm the awareness behind them right yeah. right you guys have some experience with this we can just keep jiving on this this is great and you notice that it creates i'm feeling in all of us there's a sense of relief that comes with that isn't there yeah like a pressure has been released yeah because awareness, you can notice for yourself, awareness isn't under any pressure. Right. Awareness is the experience of no pressure. Right. And the more I give my attention to that, the, the more relaxed I feel. It's a, it's a good place to go. It's a place of relief. And the gaps between the thoughts will increase. And people say they can't slow their mind down, they can't meditate. I'm just thinking, 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 but it will slow down. If you start Sometimes watching, I have it. trouble getting it going. Yeah. If you start, <laughs> you're just it's, there's just slow, slow down the whole day. <laughs> so, Graham, we'll, we'll talk when you talk about this slowing down. Um, I think I would describe that as one of the rules, one of the physics of consciousness. Yeah. And we'll go back more to that, but that's really important to me that you notice that awareness, relaxation actually has an effect on life. It's not. It's, even though it's detached, it feels like it's sort of yeah. in the world. There's somehow it's affecting me, my thoughts, my feelings. It's having an effect on me. That, to me, is the, the most important thing that I had to share with anybody. Wow. Is And we'll talk more about that. So if we just keep 
Darren, you have a question? Well, that's got to be getting worse when we're staring at fucking Twitter <laughs> just all day. I or, mean, yeah. like, or just stuck in your head thinking, 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 well, right? Yeah, I mean, we, you're stuck thinking and you're addicted to information at the same time. Absolutely. So in, in traditional Buddhism, they would say basically life is going in two directions. It's either going like this or it's going like this. Meaning I'm either, I'm either letting go or I'm accumulating more things. Yeah. Those are the two directions of consciousness. And you're absolutely right. We can begin to see there's, there are here, we're feeling two directions. One, I'm moving in a direction towards release, relaxation, expansion. And then the other, when I just am addicted to information, I'm storing stuff. I'm becoming denser. I'm weighing myself down. And we feel that. We feel that after we get in an argument with someone and we're carrying it. It doesn't feel good. But if we have a moment, uh, even a quiet moment, and we're not carrying so much, we feel better, right? So if we go a little further, Darren, um, we just we went from a mind to just notice that you can feel your body. And I would say that your body is information. And you can just notice that in terms of sensations, you can, f you can perceive information. I'm cold. I should have brought my robe. Right. It's a great example. And again, you are aware that you're cold. If you weren't aware, you wouldn't know. And you can focus on awareness. And how is awareness different than a cold body? I'd be more interested in how I can change my awareness to not be cold. Right. Is awareness cold? No. <laughs> well, we're off to a good start. So now your experience is two parts. On one hand, you're cold, and on the other hand, you can't be cold. Does that sound true? Kind of. Okay. That's a tougher one to... Okay. Just just if you come back to the sense of awareness, is awareness, We, we you said this already, but is awareness cold? No. Could you imagine awareness getting cold? Well, I could imagine it getting cold and then getting warm, and I, I don't know. Yeah, I guess I could. No, I, no, I can't. <laughs> we'll just we'll just leave it for there. Another way, and we'll make a big, uh, important leap here is for both of you guys. You can notice that awareness also feels like I am. Would you say that's true? When I contact awareness, it feels like I am. Yep. Being. And we, we over, we, we, um, we skip past this because we're busy just exactly what Darren said. We don't want to be cold. We want to do something to not be cold. And obviously I'm not saying don't put on a sweater, just sit there, but we're really focused on information. We keep contracting our focus to deal with things. I got to go do something. And every time we do that, we tend to unless we have practice, unless we're really intentional, we tend to move away from awareness. Or you could say we tend to move away from ourselves and become focused on the information that we perceive. Makes sense. So what we're doing right now is we're doing what they would call therapeutically is pendulating. So it's like a pendulum. As you practice at first, you move between the stuff that I'm experiencing and awareness. We just practice this over and over again. My thoughts, awareness. My feelings, awareness. My body, awareness. And more and more, we get access to the space of being aware. Self-inquiry really starts off when we say, what am I? What we're really supposed to find, the object that we're supposed to find is awareness, the sense of being. We realize that's what's consistent in my experience. <clears throat> Whether I'm hot or I'm cold, no matter where I am, it's this sense of being aware, this I am, which is actually really living my life. So. Is there a fifth one for me? Could be, absolutely, absolutely. I appreciate your enthusiasm. So you can feel your emotions. You just see right now how you feel emotionally. And actually, I'm pretty calm right now. Great. Maybe I should have done the emotional one first. Yeah, we can. I can All just focus on awareness has calmed me down. I just I can just trigger you and say, you know, they, <laughs> uh, you, I can't think. Of I so can much. look at my phone for a second, then I'll tell you what. 
Yeah, anyways, so but listeners, everybody, Darren, you just notice how I feel emotionally, and it could be happy, anxious, doesn't matter. And I become aware of that feeling. Obviously, there's awareness. Otherwise, I wouldn't have be aware of my feelings. And I focus on awareness. And I notice however I feel, awareness is not a feeling. Yeah. It's not unstable. It's not changing. It's not reactive. It's eternally peaceful and quiet. And just to both of you, if I, as we've been sitting here with this kind of focus on awareness, um, and Graham, you spoke about it, how is this affecting your body, your mind, your emotional world? I feel relaxed or calm, just, yeah, I do. Yeah, it's definitely almost like a chill sort of pre almost feeling, you know? pre is that a word? I can make up words too. You have to explain the word, though. Yeah. I don't know. Well, elation's like that feeling when they play the little video with the kid whose dad surprised him when he comes home from the war. You know what I mean? He shows up in his class, and everyone gets that same feeling in their chest, and there's sort of that weird no way to sort of describe it. Uh-huh. I've heard it described as elation. Did you feel it in your chest? Well, it's the same. The, the, the way uh, Blaze des- described it as a lightning is very, very apt as well. Yeah. Right. That's a good point. I can feel energy as well. When I close my eyes to feel the calm, I can feel a... So the further we do this, both of you guys are you're demonstrating my, my thesis, my main pitches, is we are, we are choosing to refocus our consciousness, and life is moving from being more physical. We're noticing more of a sense of energy, of flow. We can feel pressure or density or relaxation more. We become more aware of this other level of change that we tend to act on top of in our life, right? Yeah. I'm a construction worker. It's not really relevant to my craft, um, whether I feel elated or relaxed or open. Um, I'm being paid to build a house in a certain period of time. And so it's not relevant. So we don't put our focus on it. Traditionally, we have not put our focus on this. But the three of us are sitting here, we're putting our focus on it, and it's changing or transforming our experience. Just from focus. So if somebody comes to you and you're on the you know, the feeling part, and they're full of anxiety or resentment or frustration. Um, Fear. Do you, do you transmute that energy somehow into your body or into another... Uh, or, or just the act of observing it through awareness is is an, is enough to lessen it. Right. Well, before before I answer that, I want to say that we're starting to, or as part of my answer, we're starting to get a contrast. We're we're getting a window into a contrast between things that feel more tight or contracted and things that feel more open. Mm. Awareness is my sort of barometer for openness, because if we just look we see there's no contraction or tightness in awareness. So now I have a contrast. I can feel in my body things that are tight relative to awareness. So for example, fear. I could feel in my body that I had a fear maybe in my in my chest or in my, in my belly. And what I would notice if I stayed with awareness, if I was being aware, is that it would feel tight. My body feels tight. And so... It doesn't feel good. And the first thing that we want to do is we want to stop. So the old way of making our feelings stop, of being fear, is to apply some sort of force to distract ourselves, to take a pill, to eat something, to tell somebody to shut up. We use another form of contraction and tension to help us manage the tension that we already have. Now we have two tensions, right? Now we're depressed and we're drunk. And now we're now we feel bad about the fact that we got fired and we're angry at our partner or whatever it is. We've we've created more tension. And so that doesn't work. And we try it as much as we we will all try it until we don't anymore. But it doesn't work to solve those problems like anxiety or fear, uh, clearly on the level of using force. If you distract yourself, your fear is still going to come back at some point. We all know this. 
So as you say, what is the other way? Well, my physics for consciousness is the same as if you were to have a um, compressed gas in a chamber. Like imagine a propane tank. So everything that we don't like, in my opinion, is in a state of contraction. So if I want to release propane out of a propane tank, I would just take the lid off of it. I don't have to ask or apply force. It's going to move from higher pressure to lower pressure, right? That's what it wants to do. It, it's actually seeking uh, a kind of release into a, in a less pressure. But I would say that our feelings are too. I would say all the feelings that we're carrying, everything in, in our emotional world is actually seeking release. It's seeking relief. So the, the trick is that to learn, just as I'm trying to manage my feelings through a kind of contraction, is to do the opposite. It's to actually open the door. It's to relax. And the, the way that I can relax is becoming aware of awareness. So whether you're having a feeling now that's uncomfortable or pleasant, it doesn't really matter. Just see if you can feel your feelings at the same time that you feel awareness and observe what happens. Feels to dissipate a little bit. Yeah. At least whether it moves or not, we can feel that there's space to. If I asked you, Graham, how much space is there in awareness? How it's big is it? Infinite, it feels like. Is there enough space for our fear and our anger there? Yeah. Right. So it's a very, very big space. So what I the primary thing that I teach people is essentially how to apply awareness to their life and to their bodies. Um, everything that we carry, whether it's our trauma or our habits or whatever whatever pain or limitations we call we have, they're all in a state of contraction. That's why we that's why they're not functional. That's why they're not very flexible. That's why they're repetitive. That's why they don't feel good because they're in a state of kind of a stored, compressed or contracted state. My solution to that is to introduce an infinite space for them to relax into. Yeah, that's very interesting. I had a visual representation of that, not pulling, let's say, that emotion into awareness, but letting it dissipate in, and it just dissipates into, you know, right. into nothing. And at first you say, like, well, like, what's the doing? What's the action, right? What's the, we're used to, we're supposed to do something. We're supposed to forgive ourselves or tell ourselves that we love ourselves, tell ourselves that it's okay. Um, you know, we're supposed to do something. That's what we're used to. Um, but the, the action in consciousness, it's, a, it's different. The physics, productivity, work, all the things that we do so well physically, it's very different in consciousness. The primary, the, the sole form of productivity is relaxation in consciousness. Soul as in S-O-U-L? The, the only. Oh. The single way in which things really change in consciousness or things get done. Work gets done is through relaxation. Hmm. And so we begin to get glimpses of this here between us with a single feeling. Um, and you sort of go, oh, actually, that works. And the guy's saying something that actually works. And it's really not that hard. And means that I don't have to be in conflict with myself. I don't have to argue with my feelings. I don't have to argue with my fear. And just, we won't belabor this too much, but before we go on, just see... What is awareness's attitude about your body? Just see how does it, what's its, um, how does it treat you as a body? You get a sense of that? That's a hard one for me. My attitude? I feel, no, like in your body, in your body, right? Imagine again, right now, you you feel your body, you look at awareness, and you see. What's a, how does awareness relate to my body? How does it treat me as a body? Awareness thinks I'm sexy. Absolutely, it does. Absolutely. Awareness.
Ernest thinks whatever you're doing is you the greatest thing that ever happened. It's refreshing. Yeah. So I'm trained as a therapist, and and most people what they wish they their 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 whole body is structured because they didn't get that in their childhood from their parents and their world from their environment. Mm. They really wanted that. They you could say they needed it, and they continue to look for it in relationships. They continue to look for it in something that someone's going to say or that they'll say to themselves. And they keep looking for the perfect parent in the field of information. Right? We get into this relationship and we hope that this person is going to do something. I'm going to perceive some information that's going to make me feel like I'm okay. And what, what I what's very important is to realize this refreshing, very, very refreshing ability to do that unconditionally for myself right now. I don't need to accomplish anything. I don't need to change. I don't need to you know, stop being a jerk. Whatever it is that I'm doing, awareness is unconditional love and acceptance. Mm. Every moment of the day has awareness. Therefore, it is possible to experience unconditional love and acceptance all the time. You see what how your body, your mind would respond to that sort of support, that sort of consistency, care. And this explains why you're meditating or in the flow state of something that you're not worried about your emotion or your body or anything. You're not thinking about that. If you're, you know, playing music or in a sport or whatever it is that gets you in the moment, so in the moment that all, you're just pure awareness then, I guess. Right. Right? All that right. other stuff is, is the subconscious is working the program in the back. You're doing what you've practiced doing for 10,000 hours or whatever, and you're just full awareness into the moment. And I know you play, play hockey, but loving something that you do, like really from the, from the standpoint of your body, just being totally absorbed in it and, and awareness, they kind of have the same attitude, right? They're, they're, they're pretty much the same thing. And um, the only thing is that when we're playing hockey or something, we're really absorbed more in the information. That flow state is happening, but we're still really busy. This is slightly different because I'm turning to awareness in a way. Um, I'm making it my sole object of attention. I'm yeah. making it most yeah. important right. in my life. Absolutely. That's why people love art and music and because the, it gives them access to a, a kind of a continual yes for their creativity. Right. So when you, you ask about manifestation, I mean, that is a very creative space, a space where you're sort of unconditionally supported to be yourself. That is a creative space. And so when we look to like, what do I want to do with my life? How do I want to, who do I want to be? More and more we are acting kind of a flow. Yeah, that makes sense. I like it. Bingo, bango. Huh. The next thing you can notice, and um, I won't take you too far, but if you just look around you, just at everything around you, you might notice, you might be able to see that everything that you see is actually inside the experience of being aware. Again, you couldn't see me if you didn't have awareness. You wouldn't be able to see the computer or the opponents on the other team or the cars that you drive by, your partner, your wife, your husband. It's because they're inside the experience of being aware. Mm -hmm. So if we take this a little bit further, we can realize everything we experience is actually inside of our awareness. And everything is. I mean, you could go somewhere else where, you know, even like what about the astral? What about the stuff you can't physically experience, right? All of it's inside of awareness. Yeah. That's my experience. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is it. When I told you the first time I ever had experience, it was like everything was here. I would just look over it. Again, the, the False Creek in Vancouver, and it was like it was here. And I couldn't really tell you what was happening. <clears throat> but it was a shift in focus to, um, to this state of awareness that has everything is inside of awareness. 
right? Your thoughts, your feelings, the things you see and hear, all of these are inside. And right now, as you're listening to me, I know that you are refocusing, you're shifting your perception to see if that's true. A refocusing is happening. And just ask yourself, have I ever experienced anything outside of my awareness? Do you think that causes some confusion in a world where we're getting information from outside of our awareness, like beamed in all over the place all the time? Like that, it seems like it's got to cross some wires. Well, this, this creates a lot of confusion because it shifts the way we experience reality. Confusion and what is he talking about? And is that true? And it's all a part of this refocusing. But I would, I would question that when things beam in, um, I don't think they're actually outside of awareness. That's not my experience. Right now, I am beaming in from the Silicon Valley. Can you say that uh, I am outside of your awareness? No, but I know that when I pick up my phone and open Twitter, something that wasn't in my awareness is going to cr crawl its way in, and I'm going to wish it never did. Right. Yeah, I understand that. Which is kind of unprecedented in human history, probably, you know. I thought you meant the actual now. physical EMF waves, that kind of thing. No. Beaming in. I wasn't going that far down the rabbit hole. There's a couple different qu there's a couple different question <laughs> questions there that I've seen. One is um, what do we do in a world that is so information driven in which we're actually connected to, you know, we used to live in small villages and maybe we'd have a you know, maybe we'd have a piano or something and that would be our craft. And now we have the internet and we can choose to be or do anything. We can listen to what anybody has to say at any moment. There's a tremendous amount of information in the world. And, and um, how do we stay focused on ourselves, or how do we ground ourselves, or be um, make sense of a world that seems to be kind of getting very big, an experience that's getting very big? Um, does that sound like one of the questions you were asking? Yeah, kind of. I'm kind of relating it back to a quote I seen a while back that was overstimulation is not awareness. And, um, you know, I think that we're kind of seeing the results of a perpetual state of overstimulation. Right. I and mean, that was awareness in a different context, but it still applies. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is. And, and my solution to that is like, you know, obviously you have – both of you have chosen not to disconnect yourself from the world. As challenging as it is, you still look. You still want to know. I mean, you you might cringe before you look to see what's happening in the United States politically every day, but you look. You Some part of you cares and wants to know. And I would say that it's not a really viable solution for most of us to tune that out. I think what is a viable solution is for us to get better at processing information. And if you just look to awareness right now and just see, how, how would I gauge awareness's ability to tolerate information? Can awareness tolerate information? Yes. So it's, it's, it's discerning it, tolerating it, not attaching yourself to it, observing it without, with, yeah. you know, non-attached appreciation. Yeah, and actually, and here's where I take a bit of a radical step. So... Um, this is where I get, this is what I'm most excited about, and I hope it makes sense. So right now, we've said, look, if you, if we feel our bodies, if we feel our emotions from awareness, relaxation happens, change happens. I observe that. I was afraid, and now I feel calm. Something has happened. Being aware is productive. So I don't distinguish the things that are inside my body and the things that are outside. I truly believe that awareness changes all information in the same way. Whether it's a text from someone else, whether it's some person on the other side of the world, if I am aware of it, the same process is happening. It's universal. So right now, I am inside of your awareness. If you could feel, if you were able to feel, have empathy for me, for example, to have a sense of how I feel or some, if I shared some hardship. If you could experience that at the same time as you were aware, you would change my life in the same way that you change your life with your fear. So this interconnectedness is actually, for me, is a tremendous possibility 
for us to be very productive. And just I'll pause to see if does that make what I'm saying make sense to you? Yeah, in a way, it's what uh, Jamie Janover just said about um, when you're in your higher vibration, when you're experiencing that higher vibration and you would connect with somebody else, you may help create that higher vibration in them. Absolutely. So, I mean, that's what I'm, um, I'm a somatic therapist and my job is people have feelings and my job is essentially to feel them with them. And people, that's part of my job, obviously teaching people about consciousness and helping them to connect to awareness and all of these other things is a part of my job. But I'm trained to feel with people. So somebody has an overwhelming feeling, and my job is actually to feel it with them. And all day long, I experience myself feeling people's pain or desires, and that strengthening this physics, this actual physics of change, transformation of expansion actually increases. And so I'm very familiar with this. So at first it feels a little maybe strange to consider that something over there could be changed from here, right? How could, you know, something on the other side of the world or the other side of the room be affected by me? Well, I would say it's actually being affected by awareness. And just see the thing that's on the other side of the room. Is it outside of my awareness or is it inside my awareness? Yeah, very interesting. So that is that where it kind of departs from a lot of the Buddhist type type stuff? Because I know I've done quite a few meditations where, you know, you're you know saying affirming meta meta meditations that you know you're responsible for your reality and I'm not responsible for you. I'm responsible for me. That kind of stuff. Um, very much saying like, hey, I can't control your reality. I can't do anything. But this seems yeah. it seems to step over that a little bit. It does. Well, there are really good reasons to help people with that. There are really good reasons to tell people what you just said. Yeah. There are really good reasons to strengthen a sense of me being actually separate from you. Yeah. I do this professionally. Yeah. That's different than some guy on the street yelling at me and me feeling like it's my responsibility to solve his problems. So often what we have in ch in children is that our our relationships confuse us and sort of distort our sense of self as a, as a body and confuse the way that we perceive information from the outside. So there are lots of good reasons to tell people to actually strengthen their strength, their sense of self. But you will find that if you do that, a strengthened sense of sense of self, a strengthened ability to be in your body and to, to actually feel yourself and not leave your body, not to be overwhelmed and, and sort of spill out everywhere, that will actually create more ability to feel other people, mm -hmm. to create more ability to process other people's experience and to relate to them. So um, Buddhism is a, is a very large and very old thing. I certainly can't speak to Buddhism. What I could speak to is what I would like to see as a, as a world moving forward. Every person that we know works hard. Even if they're a bum on the street, they're very active, right? Whatever they're doing, whether they're shutting down or whether they're producing a lot, people are love to work. They're very, very active. They're always engaged in something. <clears throat> and we all agree that um, we work hard to have a mortgage or pay our bills or pay taxes or be fire people or whatever it is that we do. We all have an agreement as a culture that we're going to work together. And obviously, when it comes to certain things, that agreement breaks down. When it comes to certain contentious issues or within a marriage, that working relationship breaks down. Um, that's because it feels like if you get what you want, I'm not going to get what I want. It feels like uh, if I want a chocolate bar and you want a chocolate bar and there's only one chocolate bar, then we're going to have to compromise. I might not get what I want. So in that world, we see a scarcity of what we want. We see a scarcity of um, stuff that we need, whether it's emotional stuff or physical stuff. And we're all fighting it out for our piece of the scarcity of resources that we want. That's how we experience ourselves now. 
And I, that's true physically. That's how we experience it. If somebody drank my glass of water, I wouldn't be able to drink it. And I would ask them not to. But in consciousness, there is no scarcity. There is only more or less flow. There's only more or less um, expansion. And so what I am interested in creating is a world in which we contribute to the shared field, which all exists within our awareness. And in that field, if a person that I, you know, that is very angry, um, if they are very angry and they stay angry, that affects my world. And so if I were to feel someone else, it wouldn't be because um, I'm sort of selflessly serving them, but because they're inside my experience. And I have just as much of a right to transform my experience as they do. We're all sharing the same experience. And we all have a right to um, apply our state of consciousness. We all get to do that. So in a world where there are people advocating for all kinds of different things, I get to feel that whole world. Right now, I feel when I look at the election, when I see how upset people are, when I see my neighbors talking, I get to choose what kind of relationship I have to that tension. And after all the years of my own personal process, I have decided that I'm going to choose to feel that because I want it to transform. I want it to change. And I know that that's possible. And I know that there are many people doing it. And I think what that's going to lead us to is that we are going to... Um, When I, when I found my way, when I discovered consciousness, it wasn't necessarily because I discovered it on my own. When I talk about that spiritual teacher seeing through me, I believe honestly that he contributed to my experience, that by actually seeing what was going on for me and knowing me, being able to look at me and identify what was going on with me, he allowed me to see deeper into myself than I've ever seen. So it's not so much about taking on people's feelings, but creating the ability for other people to maybe see themselves in a different way, to be able to move with things that they've been stuck with. I mean, the people in the world that are violent or angry, they're stuck. These are people that are stuck. And they, these aren't people that we can go and tell them. We can't tell them that they're stuck. We can't tell them that they are, uh, that they need to change, but we can begin to actually feel with them and help them to see what they're carrying. And I don't recommend this for anybody. This just happens to be my job. And I see it as a future that's possible for humanity in which we can use our consciousness to support each other. Because we know that we, we will grow a, a shared pie. So when you are feeling fear or anxiety as you were, and I am able to provide awareness, and that transforms your experience, that's the world is a better place for me too. Right? My world is a better place. Yeah, it's good advice right now, especially. I mean, if we can look at... Uh... All the people in the store with scared of the Rona, and the, and the, have the masks on, and we're um, or the masks off, and they're scared, or whoever, whatever. Maybe practice that. I mean, as in Darren, do you want to jump in? No, I just want to say, you know, I'm I'm really used to crisis creating change. I mean, I think that's what addiction is. Yeah. Addiction is you hit a wall, and that creates a new life for yourself. That creates a new way to perceive reality a one that you probably wouldn't have been through if you hadn't hit rock bottom you know i might have tried to just hammer it out for the rest of my life like my yeah. father for example had i not crashed so hard i'm super fortunate to have failed in a way where i knew that i failed yeah. i absolutely knew that i failed when i look at the world that we're in we we've been pretending that we're successful and that it's working out for a long time it's not so bad really if we fail, it's scary. I'm sure my mom was very scared when I was an addict and I'm right before I was in treatment. For people who are witnessing, it's very scary. But in the world, for me, I think this crisis is an opportunity to shift gears. Yeah, You can't vote our way out of it. You can't hide somewhere. You can't just hope that you have a clean source of water and you're going to ride it out. We're, we're just all, we're stuck here. And that doesn't feel good. But if you have experienced in yourself a sort of uh, a rebirth, and you know this potential of consciousness, it seems like the most likely potential for me. It seems like the way that we're going to, at least most of us are going to move through this. 
Good point. Here's hoping. Here's hoping. I mean, that is a better way to handle it no matter what happens. If you can kind of resist less, I guess. I mean, because that was my pile of questions at the beginning is, is all these choices, what do we do? How do we go through this time? You know, I guess through awareness is the best way. Well, I mean, we can we can begin to reevaluate the way we make choices. So again, I can't tell you what choices to make, but the ground that we make them on. Mm -hmm. So we can begin by knowing that I am, if our sense of self more and more rests as awareness, more and more we feel unconditionally okay. That's I, what I was going to get at. Yeah. I'm okay right now. Yeah. I may, there may be fear, there may be anxiety, but I'm not my fear and anxiety, as you've said. I'm okay. Okay. So now I'm a little bit grounded. I'm moving at a slower rate, and my choices will reflect that I have enough time and space. Trauma gives people the experience or is described as not enough time and space. So if I'm acting from my trauma or I'm, I live in a traumatized world, you will always see there's not enough time and space. So as I begin to connect with awareness, I slow down, and suddenly I get, a, I get access to an infinite space that is timeless. Now my choices reflect a higher reality. I won't choose things that come from trauma so much, I will more and more make choices that reflect and will move me towards higher consciousness. This contrast between contraction and expansion is how I would suggest we can learn to navigate our life. If it feels like this, where is it going to take us? If it feels contracted, where is it going to take us? You know, when you that, think about the, the hundred times you've told that person, yeah, well, you're a such and such and you should shut up and you know you know where that takes you right you after a while you go maybe there's probably there's got to be another way to do it right so we know we get to, we we can do experiments and when we act from contraction but when we sort of believe our fear you could say or our scarcity or our stuff that that will lead us kind of to more stuff we will continue to have to learn the lesson of doing something different so if we can begin to use awareness as a kind of a, a compass that allows us to gauge the decisions that we make, is this in kind of a harmony with awareness? Is it moving me more towards relaxation or is it moving me less? So a good example of that, Darren, is if I just stay glued to the presidential election 24 hours a day and I don't sleep, is that moving me more to a sense of relaxation, or is it moving me less? Is the stimulation that I'm taking, is that creating, is it moving me more towards the state of infinite time and space, or is it moving me away? Is life taking me to myself, or is it taking me away from myself? Yep. Yeah, that's good. I like it. You gotta stay in the moment. Wow. Right. That's a uh, great blaze. An hour and a half has flown by and a fantastic and I think uh, uniquely timely show. I just want to offer to all the people that <clears throat> are listening, if this is interesting to you, um, I have made a series of exercises, just like the one we did today, which are designed to create um, a state of consciousness which um, feels like... Uh, a marriage between this energy and this awareness. It creates a state of flow, a state of presence that will move you towards being able to recognize consciousness. Um, I'll send them to, I think I actually probably already sent them to you guys, but I will link them so that you guys can try them if you're interested and let me know how it goes for you. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I like the practical application of this stuff because I've, I've, I mean, I've experienced it myself on the couch, lying there doing these long meditations and something clicked. Right. And I like I like you know these new processes that we can try to follow that are right. very and practical. I, I'm I'm telling you after all my experience, this is just my personal experience, that there's nothing more practical or productive than consciousness. Yeah. It may not seem like that. It may seem like it's out of the way of paying your bills or getting your you know your kids fed or whatever you have to do. 
But my experience is that all of those things are actually affected by our state of consciousness, <laughs> affected by awareness. And we can learn to live in a world in which we value both our responsibilities as human beings, our, the way we talk to people, the things that we do, um, going to work, but also being aware and start to get a sense that we're being productive kind of in two dimensions at the same time. That while we're handling our worldly life, we're also changing our state of consciousness, and that's having an effect on our life. So that's my invitation is for everybody listening, whether you're doing it or not already, um, is to consider that you could add this dimension to your life, and it would be the, the piece that helps the problems, the things that don't work, that you can't work your way through, helps make those start to shift. Awesome. And then, so how else can people get a hold of you? They can, I'll put links to that in the show notes and uh, you have a website too, right? Yeah, I have a website right now. And I, right now I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, expanding. I'm looking to, to expand my career. So I have a lot of time to just give to people. So if anybody wants, they can apply on my website to have a free session with me. Oh, and, I was going to say, so we can do one-on-one -on -one with you? Yeah, I, I work with people one-on-one -on -one and I also work with some small groups. Um, and, um, but what I really recommend is if it's interesting to you, try the exercises that I've said, if that, if that's really interesting to you, then send me a message and we can, uh, or uh, there's an application form on my website that you can fill out okay. you, with me. Um, I love, I, I would be thrilled if you sent me a message or an email or you texted me, please don't hesitate whether you like what I say or not. I, I just want to get in the game. Awesome. It's been fun, man. It's been very informative too, and yeah, I appreciate great chat. it. Yeah. Hopefully, Thanks. some of our listeners will track you down. Yeah. And uh, that you can help them along their path. Well, thanks for joining us. Yeah, and just for everybody, remember, awareness is always there. That's what yeah. makes it possible. And all you have to do is want to know that. All you have to do is want it to be a part of your life, and it will show up. And Thank change. Thanks for thanks, time. buddy. Yeah, keep in touch. Thanks, oh, well. Blake. Have yeah. a great Christmas. Yeah. Two happy holidays. And that was a chat with Blake Kennedy. Which is Blaze. Blaze. Blaze Kennedy. I kept thinking Blake. I don't know why I couldn't get that out of my head. That was uh, great, man. It was good. It really resonated with me. Did it? Oh, yeah. This is good. I'm glad. Yeah, it's it's reminded me of uh the good old days. What Jamie Janover was saying too, though, about about how he gave us that practical you know, reason why we have to resonate at a higher level, you know, it just resonates. Because it makes the world a better place. Yeah. Like physically, yeah. eventually. But you know what else physics. makes the world a better place other than people like uh, Blaze and, and uh, Jamie. Jamie. Donating to the show. Donating to the show. <laughs> <laughs> GrabAmerica.ca slash support. There is this, you know, I, I jest, but there does seem to be this little, this little, Subtle effect that happens when you support the show and your karma goes up and things just start looking a little brighter because you're part of this this great community that supports the Grand America show and uh, yeah and it helps just keep the lights on because we can't do it without you either. we can't do it without you I mean literally if there wasn't a bunch of you supporting us we wouldn't exist so it's like this we're the manifestation and it's not about us even it's about people like Blaze and all the people we just give the platform to oh it's totally you not know, about us it's just for the guests and the it's listeners a, it's a platform we like to bring you guys fresh ideas provide stuff, space provide some space to think about some things maybe you haven't uh, thought about before and provide some some space to support that if you like to over at slash support if you find yourself financially challenged of course there's a bunch of ways to support the show that don't cost anything you can review the show uh rate the show share the show sign up for the newsletter send Graham some stories some Stores, feedback. Synchros, feedback. Tell us we suck. Tell us we're great. Whatever you want to tell us. Uh, Graham at GrahamAcroAmerica.com. All that other stuff is in the show notes all the time. Everything's always in the show notes. You can figure out how to do everything over in the show notes. Check that shit out. Do all that stuff. Tell your friends about this shit. And uh, just be kind to each other. Love each other. Make space for each other. Be aware of that. You know, everyone's might be freaking out and uh, just, you know, be a little easy on them. Turn the other cheek, maybe, if you can. Anyway, we love you. Thanks for listening. 
and we will see you next week. Thanks for watching. Pew, pew. Ooh, I got to pee real We'll bad. be back uh, probably with a swap cast with the melt in about 15, 20 minutes. Swap a whopping. Okay. It's going to take me a minute to shut down the stream because the mouse is so scary. Green screen behind me so I don't have to make my bed. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. That's, that's good. I sleep about 20 feet straight up. Oh, cool. Nice. Maybe less. Is it, is it soundproof? I mean, you have kids, right? Or a kid? couple kids but they're not here when they're here okay. it's not soundproof gotcha. we got a pretty good gate they get pretty rowdy sometimes uh -huh. you hear the tumbling upstairs yeah, and shit. yeah <laughs> for sure there's some of that it's kind of the equivalent of when we used to have the train come through oh uh, yeah 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 the yeah. old place so do you want to kick us off do you have an intro or something that you want to do or I don't. I, I usually my stuff is I do the interview and I doctor it up afterwards. Okay. I don't have any. Yeah. Okay. I don't do like uh, Greg with the live intro and the alliteration yeah. and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. So yeah. yeah. So it's pretty much all done in post. So. Okay. Well, we can once we start recording, I'll I'll uh, just in, introduce you and us, yeah. and then we'll do it that way. Absolutely works whenever, for me. Whenever Darren's ready. No touching, dude. It's like <laughs> a law now. You can't touch me. You guys are five feet apart, right? Yeah, barely. Okay. <laughs> this is uh, we're five Canadian feet apart. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we're roommates. I gotcha. Graham rents a room up. Uh, Graham rents the little bed there beside the bunnies. <laughs> I should actually give you. Some I'm receipts. authorized to be in his personal bubble. Yeah, I get two people cool. because I because I live alone. Fifty percent of the time. Uh huh. So I'm only allowed to have two people. But they didn't ask me to put those people on a list or anything. So it's pretty, like, fluid, too. Who's people. they? When, gotcha. when did this even come up? They're interchangeable. They's the government, I guess. Did they ask you seriously if you had two people? No. no. They haven't asked right. me anything. Yeah, yeah, okay. If they do, I'll say, uh, of course not, COVID. Of course. But so the two people is interchangeable? No. Uh, no. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> That's how I perceive it. Yeah. Actually, I I think it's, they're kind of defeat the purpose. I think, uh, yes, of course. It. I think it's very specifically written that it is not interchangeable. Yeah, for sure. What is the uh, situation like where you guys are at? You said a small town, right? Yeah, but we're close enough that we just got swallowed up and encompassed by Calgary for the lockdown mm -hmm. uh, stuff. We, oh, gotcha. we stayed we stayed away from the mask mandate on August 1st. So in our little town, people started to wear them a little bit more at the end of summer, but it was mm -hmm. not mandated until recently, very recently. And they <laughs> what, while they accomplished... Uh, that's weird. I combined a couple words there. While, while they <laughs> accomplished. Uh, yeah, while they um, implemented a, a, a stricter lockdown for us, which, mm -hmm. which uh, is still not as strict as some parts in Canada. But it's still stricter than we expected or, or wish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you get all the signs in the stores saying that you should, uh, yeah. in and order to go in, you should wear a mask. Yeah. Well, we must wear a mask, but we don't. So that's <laughs> the sign says we must. But they're pretty polite here. Nobody really gives you a hard time. Cool. There's not a lot of public shaming. The the people that own the places don't seem to really care. Mm -hmm. Or if they don't, if they care, they don't say much. Uh, sure. Sh shit got a little weird at the shoppers today. And I went to check the P.O. box. Oh, yeah. There was wow. like, I was walking up to the mailbox. Shoppers Drug Mart is where we pick. We have a P.O. box. with. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. I was walking up to the thing to go around the corner to check it. And I noticed there's this other lady there without a mask doing some stuff. And I'm like, oh, this will help. And uh, I go up around the corner and there's this, 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 little, this little lady, like, not old lady, probably like, you know, 30s. She's like crammed back in the up against the wall there, trying to stay away from this other lady doing her mail without the mask. And I come around the corner, and she's just like, "Oh my God, what is going on?" Surrounded. <laughs> no way. Totally. <laughs> I just opened the PO box and walked away and left it at that. Oh there. wow. Well, yeah, I could hear her legit panicking about being surrounded oh, yeah. by people yeah. without masks on. Well, I uh, I live in Lawrence, Kansas, which is a, it touts itself as a very progressively left town. Oh, yeah. So you get a lot of uh, virtue signaling and uh, people who will shame you, of course, passive aggressively 
online. But, you know, there have been times I've been in store. I see, I, to fill in the gaps between real work, I Instacart. So I'm in grocery stores all the time. So, oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So I get all kinds, uh, including some people that will have the sort of the loud conversation not too far away from you saying, I'm sorry, I can't focus on what you're saying because when I see somebody without a mask, I just, I just freak out. And then I'll, I'll just kind of politely lean over and go, even if they have a, a medical exemption, and she just stammers and goes back to her conversation. But people really like to puff up their chests here. It's really fucking annoying. Wow. Yeah, yeah. They like to point out when people aren't complying. Where is there again? Kansas. Lawrence, Kansas. Mm-hmm. I even. Yeah, the- uh, I just. Uh, I was actually poking around on Instacart today. I think I'm gonna give it a whirl. <laughs> I had. I had tried it before and I couldn't figure out how to get it to work in Canada. And then I found the dongle today. The little yes. toggle to toggle it to Canada. Uh-huh. So it looks like I could just get like Costco and all this stuff delivered right to my house. Absolutely. And I don't have to deal with anybody. For an extra fee, I'll do it. Okay. Deal. <laughs> that would be great. That'd be a great excuse to visit. But my produce better be fucking top notch. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get it green mm-hmm. by the time I get there. Yeah. Are we on? Are we live? We're live, I think. Yeah. We, well, I thought you went live a while ago, Darren. No? I did, but I've been fighting with it because oh. YouTube's a fucking piece of shit. Am I allowed to... Is YouTube like PayPal where I'm not allowed to disparage them? Yeah. Because you don't say anything bad about PayPal. Like... I got my first episode taken off of uh, YouTube recently. I was very proud of what? that. What? Really? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Interview with David Seaman about Pizzagate. Oh, that was a great interview. Well, thank you. Yes, that yeah. was fantastic. He's a good guy. Yeah, that was a really shit. good interview. It just, I don't know, it just flowed really well. It was, uh, yeah, it seemed very honest and open, and yeah, it was good. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so, they took I mean, it down, eh? Yeah. YouTube. I don't oh, know awesome. if they took it down because of the title or because some algorithm listened to it. So I'm going to try and put it up with a very generic title and see if see what happens with that. Do you know how that works? Uh, no, I don't know if it's either of those. What did they did they tell you at all? They said it was something about fucking cyberbullying and threats or some crazy really? i haven't oh my yeah God, yeah it's just really so ridiculous it, you're not allowed to bully pedophiles just in case you didn't know that right right uh, it let seems me... it seems to be a weird uh, yeah i mean i want to save all this for the show kind of but... yeah 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 i understand are you uh darren are you finished reading your oh yeah i'm reading uh the new covid19 vaccine thing here oh boy on uh in alberta.ca or whatever well I, th- I heard they made a comment about changing the bill of rights so that we can't say no yeah but i'd like to actually see that no can't yeah kenny said that we he he's not gonna force us oh did he but i thought but for the entirety of canada no for our little province oh, okay gotcha gotcha we'll watch it after anyway. yeah our province is, okay. is pretty much like a uh almost like the texas of Let's say the Texas of Canada in a way. <laughs> gotcha. In attitude or in size? Um, attitude. Okay. Not in size. Size would be Things the are... only thing, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Did you lock the door after or is it open? No, I didn't. It's open. Do you want me to go open it? Or? No, leave it open. My sister's coming through town. Okay. I'm going to have two cars here. Jesus okay. Christ. Oh, oh boy. Oh, in oh, trouble. Boy. Your bubble's getting too <laughs> oh, big. Oh, my God. Okay, let's. going to burst. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get this let's... Uh, fucking show on the road. Yeah, let's do it. What is it? 8.20 here. I'm going to retweet that so I could read it later. That's how you save your stuff? Sometimes, yeah. People are probably <laughs> like, what the fuck? <laughs> uh, honestly, I gotta, I, I've got I've got ways to protect my bubble. <laughs> My bubbles, the piece. my bubbles well protected. <laughs> <laughs> it defeats the purpose of a bubble, though, doesn't it? And the bubble is supposed to pop very easily. Not when it's a personal sovereignty bubble. Ah, yeah, those should be tough. Those should have plenty of armor. And well protected. Absolutely. The best defense is a strong offense. All right, Fuck shall we fire up the recorder? Let's do it. 
I think people are watching. I think people are listening. If you're listening live and you're on the chat, can you chat? Because I don't know what the fuck is going on here. I really don't. Weird. Does it not give you like a little... It does, but blinking. it's being weird because it's still in the last stream. But it's hmm. showing you talking on there, so it's got to be right. Interesting. All right, yeah, just, I see my face on the screen. Let's just roll with it. Let's go for it. It's not moving with me. Okay, you want to do something? Yeah. Okay. All right, we've got a little swap cast for you. Little bonus episode, Chris Snipes from The Melt. He's got a fantastic podcast. We were just going to go on his show, but we thought uh, he was like, well, let's maybe we should do a swap cast. So uh, we're not, we were talking about what's the etiquette for this. <laughs> and I think there is no etiquette, really. We make it up ourselves. Some people like it, some people don't. We're totally fine with it. We'll throw this episode out in our feed and your feed, and it's uh, great, yes. to, great to meet you. Yeah, we'll throw it against the wall and see what sticks. Yep. Yes, good to meet you too. Did After a long while, term? Pop, swap cast? No, no, we didn't no? coin it at all. No, we should we should try just running with that. <laughs> <laughs> the inventors be, of swap casting. <laughs> we could at least write a book on on swap cast etiquette. That's right. That's there right. You Possibly. Go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I do love your show. I mean, it's it's fascinating to me that uh, we were trying to schedule a show together. You, you had asked mm -hmm. us to come on, and I start. I always like to, even when we're going on another show, I like to try and listen to it and find out what uh, what's up with with them. And and it's just a fascinating to see a lot of the same guests that we've had on. Mm -hmm. And and I'm not trying to like reinforce this bubble, but mm -hmm. it's the, just really interesting conversations and stuff that we talk about here. And the same kind of just open minded or what how we try to be open minded and look at all Absolutely. different sides. And and uh, yeah, it's just good to. You know, it's it's just fun when I'm doing sort of I would call it kind of research for the show because I'm listening to something where me, and it and it's just thoroughly enjoyable. So I always I always appreciate that. Well, thanks so much, man. Yeah. That's that means a lot coming from you. Yeah, I've I've uh, been a fan of your guys' show for two or three years now, so it's nice to be able to interact in real time. Yeah, for so, sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I mean, you hit a lot of the same topics. I know you wanted to talk about the Great Reset a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, are you, are you approaching COVID quite a bit with your show? Like, how do you, how do you, how do you yeah. balance that out? Well, I saw that you guys had, uh, uh, Pam Popper on yep. to, yeah, I've had her on a couple of times. She, as you know, she's fucking incredible. She's right on it. I really like her take on, uh, approaching it through the legal system, something that I would never think of, but kind of taking these people down by calling them on their words and making them have, you know, back it up with something. Like, is this an emergency? Okay, define emergency. You can't, can you? Because it's not an emergency. So it's great to uh, talk to her. I talk to people that are, well, Del Big Tree. Have you, you guys yep. have had Del on, right? Yep. Yeah, he's a great source of information about this stuff. So those episodes, I kind of squeeze them out in between my biweekly shows because they're a little more timely because shit changes so much, you know. So I, I think it's, you know, I know that you guys don't, or you have mentioned at least, uh, Graham, that you you don't like to talk about it all the time, but it's hard not to in a sense because it's something we're all having to face on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think it's, uh, you know, especially people of like mind need to stick together and kind of, you know, find a way to navigate this absolute insanity. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, uh, well, I mean, I, I'm sort of of your mind where I feel like we should talk about it a little bit more. Darren is sort of of the other where he doesn't want to talk about it all the time. <laughs> so we try and pick, pick and choose the episodes where we approach it. Cause like you said, usually it's timely. So you can't yeah. just have a whole bunch in the can at once. Uh, sure. We should just start another podcast. Just the COVID podcast. The COVID, the COVID talk. This week, we'll call it COVID talk. COVID talk, eh? You can put COVID talk, eh? Talk, eh? <laughs> and it could be on Rompkin or whatever, Rothkin. Um, Roth, uh, no, Rockfin. Rockfin. <laughs> Rockfin. <laughs> that too. I mean, we want to be multi platform. Are you I guys just, on Rockfin? I just signed up for it last night. Me too. Uh, a couple of days ago. Oh my actually, God, that's hilarious. After yeah. hearing one of your episodes. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. Yeah. I like it so yeah. far. The functionality is pretty good. I like it. I mean, the the people that are on there are they really like it. So it might be a, an alternative for us. Yeah, Can we just set up sure. a vlog on there where I, when I'm 
when I'm having a rant mode, I can just come down here and fucking give her, and you do that, and it's just people pay. To <laughs> well, see I, I don't, I don't want to. I can't do that. You can do that if you want. I don't. I can't do that. I can't do that. I'll get arrested. <laughs> you don't. You don't have a key. I don't think so. No, no, no. I, I just don't like to to put. I don't like like the pressure of having to rant myself. I mean, I like oh, to yeah, interview yeah. people and ask questions. I feel like I don't know enough about anything to be honest with you. I, know I, I hear you. A lot about little things because I have a lot of yeah. different interests, but I can't dig. I was. I'd rather it, write a rant so I can like correct it and, and read it out yeah exactly well you guess you could read it but you'd know you were reading it unless you're a good reader. Well, some of the youtubers do a pretty good job <laughs> at, at, at narrating their rants that's to make them sound like rants but they're written but it's nice yeah. to be able to go back at it and take a look and make sure you haven't come off like a fucking retard exactly because that I just destroys off. the whole rant it does. It does. I go off on a tangent and I lose my train of thought in mid tangent, and that doesn't that doesn't make for a good tangent, does it? But you look like a fucking idiot. Or you go on a great rap, but you say Nassau a couple of times, and people can't take you serious. <laughs> what is it? Yes. What's it supposed to be? NASA. NASA. Yeah. NASA. Just like NASA. NASA. Okay, I'll try. Okay. Nassau. <laughs> that so, sounds very deep south from the from the. That's true. 1860s or yeah. something. Nuclear. Like, um, what were you going to say, Graham? Oh, uh, just, I mean, I hear these researchers, like I was listening to some shows on Rockfin today, actually, about the Great Reset. I mean, mm -hmm. it's John Stone and Jason Burma had a great one, and then Jay Dyer was on with Isaac Weishop. And they, these oh, guys yeah. rattle off all these, like, they've been researching this stuff, and they rattle off all these uh, facts and connections and information, and it's just like... You know, I don't know if I could ever get there to the point where I, I know that much. I mean, exactly. So those are some really, if people want to know more, those are some great shows with guys getting pretty deep into the, the geopolitics mm -hmm. of it. But I yeah. mean, I, I know it's, it's happening and they're not, they're not um, shy about it, but they're, cou they're couching it in the, in the, you know, um, very clean terms, you know, it's the build back better. It's the, yep. it does sound on the surface, <clears throat> Like it's uh, sustainable and good intentions and all, but I mean, I just don't trust any of that. <laughs> it, but it's not. but I don't know if I can articulate it to people that aren't really there yet. I don't know if I yeah. could be that guy to do that. Sure, sure. And Klaus Schmidt, I'm not sure he's the the figurehead either. He sounds like a fucking James Bond foe. Like, have you ever have you heard the guy talk? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, oh, I've seen him God. in this weird black triangular uniform too, and he looks yeah. like he's right out of a Star Wars film or something. Yeah, it's creepy. Totally fucking creepy. Yeah, it's the it's the a good way of putting it is the new new world order. It's like, but the new world order sounds so fascistic and yes. the great reset but sounds like it's a good business move. You but know? I think they've started to use new terminology. I mean, the other people I was listening to was uh, the propaganda report on the on the Roth, Rothkin as well, and they're <laughs> and they're talking about the Council of Councils, right? So the the Council on Foreign Relations is the American version of one of these councils, but there's also a council of these councils that is talking about this multilateral plan. You're gonna see you're gonna see this multilateral lingo now, multilateralism. So they were basically saying that 70 million. They're disgusted by 70 million Americans right now who actually voted for uniformism let's say or mm -hmm. not multilateralism but unilateralism you know they want to destroy that and become so they're using they're starting to use more different terms i think global civil society and and there's now a society of societies i mean this is their own lingo they're talking about mm -hmm. you know a conglomeration of ngos and charities and all these multinational societies or yeah. they, i don't even know if you can call them societies but they're starting to call them societies and there's a society of these again this is hierarchy of non-elected people trying to run the world i mean how can that exactly. go good i mean exactly I, you know they're starting off using this big what i would call this overreaction hoax it's that i'm not saying that the thing isn't real but they're using this hoax as a springboard into this new world order, the Great Reset, which they're not shy about. And there's yep. a million holes through the narrative. I mean, so if this is the way they're starting off their little push into, you know, a progressive new world order, I mean, that they're, they're not, I, I, to me, there's just no, it just doesn't, uh, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't it fit, doesn't. you know, and then, and then you're going to do rolling, rolling, um, rolling lockdowns for climate change. And I mean, one, there's going to be one thing. And I, 
and maybe these people believe in what they're doing and they have the best intention for the world. Maybe that's the case, but maybe we all don't want to be in, in that technocratic takeover, you know? Maybe exactly. we just want to be free. It seems like power in fewer hands. I mean, it's in few enough hands as it is, but this seems like it's just, you know, it's condensing the power into it. All roads lead back to the same place, but maybe they always have. Maybe it's just, this is just a more obvious way of doing it. But yeah, I agree. safety, safety playing on people's insecurities and this fear that is pumped into the uh, atmosphere about uh, the, the metaphorical atmosphere about covid and how people are you know they've got everybody turning against each other and being suspicious and you know mask mask wearing masks becomes a virtue signal even though it's been proven that it doesn't do any good and actually may do bad yeah it may do bad so, that's where i'm at yeah. i think it's doing worse i mean i really Absolutely. do i feel i feel pretty awkward um around people in masks in a new environment since our latest uh Lockdown measures mm -hmm. came into place a week ago now, Darren. Was it a week already? Uh, I, I, 25th I or 26th? I don't know. Wrong I'm guy. Not, yeah, not. But I mean, you just had that experience <laughs> today you're talking about before we started recording this. Oh, I scared the lady. On I felt the, this bad. lady. Yeah, I mean, I feel bad. The people are freaked out. I mean, they're freaked out. There's fear. And, and, I just start and, wearing my face shield and, everywhere. And people want to throw the, you know, the death count at you and all this stuff. And I'm like, mm -hmm. and, oh, there's more people in the hospitals. And that's, yes, I, I understand that. But, you know, maybe people wouldn't be going to the hospital for some of the things they're going for if they weren't scared yep. shitless that they're going to exactly. die of this. Exactly. I mean, where is the, where's the health measures that you can do at home? Your vitamin D, your vitamin C. You know, mm -hmm. your zinc. Why Why aren't we getting a little bit of sun and some exercise? Well, there's no talk of that at all. Still, yep. after all these months when we've been bitching about that for since the beginning, where's yep. the natural stuff? There's natural cures. Oh, or study. Even, yeah, go ahead. Hydrochloroquine. I yeah. mean, that's that has much more of a, of a history to it of success than any of this other shit. Certainly a vaccine that's only been tested for what? Five or six months? Are you yeah. kidding me? <laughs> it's yeah. ridiculous. The ones that have been tested for five or six years are dangerous. And they're or go ahead. The ones that have been tested for fifty years are dangerous. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There was just a poll here. I just came across it before we started recording. And they're already. It's just. Oh, I just. I. 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 I'm having a real hard time with this. Mm -hmm. The poll is, um, should people have to provide proof of COVID-19 immunization in order to access? businesses and services this is in our local local uh newspaper the anchor insane the anchor no ct ctv news oh, so oh maybe it's no it's calgary ctv calgary I don't and it's calgary good yeah but it's right our next door paper, so our local paper is the anchor just so, so you know. luckily it's right now at 61 percent no and 39 percent uh yes but i mean just the fact that they're already assuming that people there's going to be a vaccine that works and people are going to be yep. taking it. I mean, and exactly. now they're already they're already at the point where they're just saying, "Hey, should you need to prove that before?" You, if they've had this vaccine, why why do they why do they need why do they care what we do? Absolutely. And do you guys have anything like equivalent to Operation Warp Speed going on there? No. Yes, it's called Operation Empty Your Frickin' Federal Wallet <laughs> to fund Warp Speed and all these other initiatives. Uh. We just like funding everything. It's not. They just send so billions nuts. of dollars. They fund all the stuff with billions of dollars going to these initiatives. It's just disgusting. It's a big pharma is just really coming in and they're making their big play. This is it. And oh like God, you said, yeah. they've been planning this stuff for, for years. This is just now the technology and the tool to enable yep. them to really start taking over the world. It's perfect and timing. Yeah, it's perfect timing. And mm -hmm. And then at the same time, they can get Trump out and they can get the you know, unilateralism out of the way, get mm -hmm. us into this global society. Yep. And they've been, I mean, I'm reading these secret societies books and, and this stuff has been, there's been these push and pulls of European uh, secret societies and, and global, like people always trying to take over this and that and create wars and fund this and fund that. And now I feel like it's gone from that where there's obviously still some of those more esoteric ones running some of the stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. but I also feel like now they're just NGOs, you know, now they're in the open. They're just mm -hmm. fake charities and NGOs that are funding, yep. funding everything and running, running the, running the thing here. It's the yeah. new sort of like kind of the modern 
modern age of those. Instead of all these other societies that are sort of semi-secret, now it's just all in the open. They don't even they don't even care now. They just say what they're going to do. Yeah, absolutely. I think the technocratic aspect of it is pretty sinister and and chilling too. You know, like how. Uh, they want everything to be digital. Obviously, we've known about this that, you know, slowly we're turning into a cashless society. All your medical records can be accessed through a chip in your wrist or, you know, they'll probably start with something like a little Fitbit that you wear on your on your uh, wrist first and foremost so it doesn't seem as sinister. You can take it off if you want to. But everything is going to be controlled technologically and from a distance and that's you know that that we're used to that equating with convenience for our end of things but it's also convenient for them to control everything that goes through those channels it's yeah. very book of revelations yeah yeah and and uh, you know and a, a part of me like we all knew that things weren't weren't correct i mean we all kind of wanted i mean especially in this community we mm -hmm. wanted a, a reset of some sorts i mean we don't sure. want to use up other resources we want to take care of the environment we want to we know that people can't hardly make a living. I mean, there needs to be, you know, most of us went through the zeitgeist phases and all that kind of stuff. I mean, we've thought about money being evil, all these weird things that we would rather have this, you know, abundant society, but we don't even get mm -hmm. the choice now. It seems like yeah. just if we, I wish they could just say, Hey, if you guys want to live in this technocratic society, where we're going to just jab you with all this stuff and we're going to basically turn you into a transhuman Mm -hmm. And or 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 not. If you don't want to, just yep. go go somewhere else. You know, yeah, I wish you have to be on an island. Yeah, somewhere. yeah. But now there's not. Now it's just that you're not gonna. You're gonna be, you know, shunned. And uh, but I mean, I think this is where we're at now. It's it's happening. Sure. Yeah. I don't think there's any. I don't know how much of it is threats and how how if they'll if they'll accept a 50 percent uh, success rate on this initiative. You know, mm -hmm. if as long as they get their vaccines out, maybe that's enough. Maybe they'll they'll back off a little bit or maybe after um, after Biden fully takes the hell, maybe they'll back oh, off a bit. I mean, I don't know. I don't know where it's going to end, but it's too late to wake people up. I mean, that's not something we can do anymore. Yeah. It's now sure. I, I feel like now it's connect with. People, like-minded people in your local community, maybe get on an, a, an app, a chat app, like a WhatsApp mm -hmm. or something with them or make some plans. Or I, I just feel like just having those talks with your loved ones that like, hey, this is this is what I'm going to do if they come with the, the needle. I'm not going to take it. And that might mean <clears throat> this or that. And maybe prepare for disengaging for a couple of years. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. but yeah, It's like a fucking Black Mirror episode. It is. <laughs> Yeah, it totally. is. Have you guys lost any any friends, any people that maybe acquaintances or something throughout all this because you're disagreed with them, or they oh, disagreed oh, with lost you? Rather? That way, I was thinking you yeah. meant lost. Uh, totally. No, 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 no. I'm pretty. I'm pretty. Uh, I feel super grateful. I flip flop back and forth between disappointed with humanity completely <laughs> and super grateful that I have tons of support, like my family, my girlfriend. Even work people, friends mm -hmm. here, everybody's very supportive. I can talk to everybody. I can pretty much Fantastic. say what I feel. And mm -hmm. it's like we were talking about before when Darren walks around without a mask on. And me too, even. They're probably like, nobody really shames you. Sometimes mm -hmm. they get scared, like Darren was saying today. But it's pretty good. I mean, I feel mm -hmm. pretty supportive. But good. Uh, the guy that organized the rally in Calgary last weekend just got a knock on the door from the cops. So this is coming right out of like what was happening four months ago in Australia or England. You know, you see all those viral videos and they're fining him. What was it? They fined him like $1,250, I think, for organizing more than 10 people together. What was the rally? A uh, freedom walk kind of thing. Uh -huh. was, yeah. Like an anti-mask. Anti yeah, and, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so they're well, starting to physically come to your door and try and give you fines for organizing stuff like that. Which mm -hmm. might be the best case scenario. I mean, it might be good to get a fine because then you get a court date and then you can start a GoFundMe or something and hopefully get a bunch of money in it. Not a bunch, but, you know, 10 or 20 grand so you can hire mm -hmm. a good fucking lawyer sure. and start bringing some of this stuff in front of the courts and see how they're mm -hmm. going to weigh in on it. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Have you guys uh, signed any of Pam Popper's petitions or signed up to her site? Are you members of? I guess you're not Americans, though. Are exactly, you? exactly. I went to do <laughs> it. Shit. I went to do it, and I was like, yeah, it's probably not. You know, Damn. yeah. I was saying for the Americans. Yeah. We gotta have a make Canada free again. Yeah, we do have a freedom for Canada. We might have them on. Uh, we do have them on uh, next. Oh, I'm hoping to have them on next week. I don't know. I oh, don't cool. think it's anywhere near what Pam's got going on. But there's a couple mm-hmm. initiatives happening here in Canada. So gotcha. Yeah. Well, I, as I said uh, before, you hit record. I'm in grocery stores a lot, so I hear a lot of chatter, and people love to chatter loudly. And I hear, you know. Well, I hear that the the emergency rooms are just overflowing. So I, you know, after hearing that enough, that you know, I had a visceral reaction to that. Like, well, maybe there is something to this. So, uh, a friend, well, actually, somebody, a woman whose kid goes to the same school my kid does. Um, she works in the local hospital. So I thought, well, I'll just text her and see, you know, what the hell's going on from her point of view. So I said, I asked some very simple questions. I just said, so is this, are you, is, are the emergency rooms overflowed? Are you guys just brimming over with COVID patients? And uh, some very non-confrontative, you know, just sort of acting like I was new to all this, just asking questions. And so she started just giving me some information. Well, we, you know, we've got 33 member or 33 patients in the hospital now, and uh, they have COVID, and uh, you know, it's pretty intense. We're making room for more. And I said, okay. Well, then I started asking questions that were a little deeper than that. Like, okay, do they did they test positive for COVID? Are they sick with COVID, or do they have COVID and they're sick with something else? They have some comorbidity or something like that. And she started to get a little more abrasive. Um, Anyway, the text, this lasted over a period of probably 48 hours, ended up with her telling me that she hopes that I die. Wow. Uh, And that my questions were very passive aggressive and almost assaulting to her. Uh, And that, you know, if me or my kids or my girlfriend end up in the hospital. She'll take care of us because that's what she does. But she, she, she wishes the worst for us. And I said, well, you know, 33 people out of a population of 98,173 doesn't seem that bad, you know, especially since most of them probably aren't suffering from COVID proper. And she just went apeshit. She stopped speaking any reason whatsoever and then you know ended with hoping that i die so that's i've known her for like eight years and that's what it's come to so it's just insane yeah that's crazy i have a i've been hearing a little bit that the hospitals are getting busier too from people that i know not just from the news and all that so i appreciate <laughs> that that's happening and and sure. I've, I've heard a lot of deconstruction from no agenda that that have talked about examples of the media just saying well it's a hundred percent increase when really the you know the 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 attendance could go from two to four and they're calling it a hundred percent increase like making yeah. it seem like it's you know it's a exactly. big difference. Big difference between forty to eighty than two to four, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, but that's the thing is I ask, I try and ask some more questions, like from people that are telling me. Well, I know a friend that works in the hospital, and he's telling me that there's it's increased. I'm like, well, is this from people that are really sick, or is this from people that are just testing positive but aren't showing signs, or how, yeah. or they're in there for something else because that's what happened in the when they opened everything back up, the cases went up because everybody went to the hospital and they tested everybody. Yeah. So exactly. you're going to get that percentage of positives no matter what, depending on where, where, how you're testing. So, but you can't even, you can't even get any answers about these. Even people mm-hmm. that have had people die of COVID. Like I, I just try and ask, like, was it only from COVID? How was it? Like, was he really mm-hmm. sick? Was it, you know, like a, I think your friend Darren of Darren's died as a, of a heart attack and they put it down as COVID. They actually called the the family and said, we're putting this as COVID on the death certificate, even though it was they a heart sent attack. A letter. Yeah. They sent a letter. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, but you can't like, you're right. You can't, as soon as you start asking these basic questions, which should mm-hmm. be part of the fundamental data infrastructure, Absolutely. What did they die from, not just with? And was it, mm-hmm. you know, which which actually Alberta has pretty good stats on the comorbidities. I mean, it, it, it kind of created a couple national headlines there because they're like, all we need to know about COVID is what Alberta is telling us with their data. Because it was <laughs> saying that there was 
Well, do you want to pull up the stats actually, or should I? Right. Basically saying that like, what is it? Sixty percent of the people that passed away had three comorbidities, and then the ne the next twenty had two, and the next ten had one, mm -hmm. and there was ten people in the province. Of all the five hundred deaths to start with here, the the year mm -hmm. year to date, mm -hmm. were from COVID only, and but nobody nobody else is taking the this uh, inf nobody else is uh, um, capturing capturing not, this information. That was not from the official Alberta. Yes, it was. It was. I've been on there since then a couple times. It's from someone the, um, mined it out. No, no, no. It's from the actual. It's actually great. There's a da there's a there's a if you go to alberta.ca, you'll find it on there. Go to there and they'll find you. Give the statistics. Statistics? Statistics map or the no, the yeah, this yeah, the, right there. Over here for no. now. You think you just passed it? And yeah. Come in on. in Canada do people do the hospitals one above, get one above. Sorry. Yeah. Do the hospitals get money yeah. when they call it COVID? No, it's not the same. That's one of the mm -hmm. that's one of the benefits, right? I think that's really one of the reason why our death rate is is down as well. I mean, mm -hmm. there's been some real oh, messes with the with the compensation of of all this. I mean, even the states were getting like, I mean, and the stuff you hear about it once and then it gets glossed over. And nobody talks about it, but the states were getting upwards of a hundred or two hundred thousand per case in some instances. Like, how can yeah. that be? But yeah. You know the cases are going going way up, and and then oh, so so what I was getting at is is that even though the the top health officials of Canada and the U.S. have said they've said we are going to put down COVID as on the death certificate, even if it's if they died with it but not from it. I mean they've come out and said this. Yeah. How can that not raise a bunch of red flags? How can exactly. anybody be analyzing any data if they're exactly. just saying they're putting it on, on all the, and there's so much at stake. It's not like yeah. there's a little bit at stake. I mean, they're, they're basically ruining the global economy. It's the, it is the, the, the demo, the controlled demolition of yep. the American empire, the Western, so, the Western empire. It's so fragmented too. Everybody can take their own little sliver of the of the pie and get the whatever information they want to zoom in on that and exclude all other information. Yeah, and that's especially in something like this. And I don't know what it's like there, but here, you're so shamed and <laughs> called a complete kook if you even question the narrative. Exactly. If you even question it. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's nuts. And that's yet, all nuts. you could do, you don't even have to use. You just have to use your own data. This is what's yeah. so crazy making about it. Sure, there's a bunch of go, yeah. Go even even on website. even on masks. I mean, even if you look back at, hey, this is where your mask mandate was. This is where your lockdown was. Look what's happened to the cases. I mean, it yep. can't get much worse than that. Exactly. You really think that the masks are helping now, and you're pushing them even farther when you've seen the cases rise? Yep. So Darren's got it open here. The initial. Uh, Sorry to get all excited. I'm just, I'm just, it's, it's, it's a, get excited. He gets 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 excited. So Darren's okay. got it open here. Have him take his blood pressure pills. I'll go through it. So speaking of which, you got to calm down because hypertension is the number one COVID comorbidity. <laughs> yes. You got to take your vitamin D. My girlfriend keeps saying, take your vitamin D. Yeah. So we've yes. got, uh, 87.6%. Of people who've died of COVID have had hypertension. Uh, there is a note that says one individual can have multiple conditions. So out of uh, 500 and some deaths in Alberta up till now. This is like official data. 87.6% per, <laughs> of the people have had hypertension. 57.7% have had dementia. 54.5% have had cardiovascular diseases. 43.4% diabetes. Uh, 43.3% renal diseases, 38.6% respiratory diseases. Uh, so you can think if 87%, so nine out of every 10 have the hypertension. So every mm -hmm. other of these are added to that. So that means pretty much you can go scroll down and there's so a visual a representation of that. have even three, three of these. So we mm -hmm. got. Uh, so we'll go down to the colors, yeah. The color. So there, so the Don't deceased on the, the deceased uh, on the here. left, right? There, well, where are you going? What? Here okay. it is. Okay. Here's your one. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yes. With no comorbidity, comorbidity, comorbidity <laughs> eleven people in Alberta, which equates to two percent of all deaths. 
with mm-hmm. one condition, there's been 27 people, 5% of all deaths. With two conditions, plus COVID, there has been 86 deaths, which is 15.9% of the deaths. And then with three or more conditions coming in at 417 or 771 Four out of five, three out of four, somewhere in between there. Uh, 7.7 out of 10 people have three or more comorbidities at time of death, with those top comorbidities being like hypertension and uh, mm-hmm. and dementia. So that's mm-hmm. not to minimize any any deaths at all, but it's to, it's to put things into perspective. I mean, yeah, here absolutely. we are shutting down completely and masking everybody up when the, obviously mm-hmm. the people that are very vulnerable are the ones suffering from this. So we yeah. haven't even been able to stop the vulnerable people from from getting this and mm-hmm. dying with this or from this. Mm-hmm. And and there's two, 11 people that apparently had no comorbidity. I don't know what the, the situation is with that, but sure. Um, that's terrible. But, but I mean, but look at what we're too. doing. I mean, so, look at what we're doing. So now we do need to come in on those 11 people that have died with no comorbidities. Uh, the average age is 82. Mm-hmm. And the life expectancy in Canada is 82.25 years. <laughs> so old age is what they died of. <laughs> so it would seem that... If but we, they tested positive, or did they even? Yeah, I mean, they might have just coughed before they passed it, away. You're within a percentile of being... I mean, if you call the average life expectancy as being a comorbidity, which I would argue you could take the average life expectancy for a country or region and call that once you're past that, that's a comorbidity. Mm-hmm. You're past the point yeah. where the average person makes it. So then you're, you, I mean, Look at you it's almost like the warranty. <laughs> right when the fucking warranty expires, you motherfuckers. <laughs> well, it's like, it reminds me of the old Saturday Night Live episode back in the 70s when it was still good, uh, where John Belushi is a cop. He breaks into this apartment throws a pot, uh, a bag of pot on this, uh, so that they have to catch it. And then he shoots them and he says, it's another pot related death. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Totally what it is. Yeah, exactly. So in Alberta, our life expectancy is actually only uh, 81.5. Hmm. So they, those people were actually doing good. Yeah. So, I mean, you, so you got to think half of those people are below that if that's the average. So you're talking mm-hmm. about, honestly, if we're going to take old age as a comorbidity, you're talking about five people yeah. out of, you know, 20,000 active cases now, more like, you know, however many it's been over the course of what's going on a year, 10 mm-hmm. months, eight months, nine months. Yeah, and I think you're coming up with you know because everyone's like, where is this ninety nine point nine nine seven? Well, there's that's where it comes from. Yeah, that's where, that's it, comes where from. it comes from. Start taking <clears throat> the average life expectancy for your region as a comorbidity, and then yep. and I'm not. I mean, I've got you know people I know that are in that age group, and I don't want to see anything happen to them. But of at course. the same time. But why are you putting all the money, billions of dollars, into protecting no, them? This is it. I yeah. think pharma's straight up just taking a run on it. Oh yeah. This is pharma. Just they, this is at, at the at the least malevolent level. I think it's fucking a bunch of pharma companies taking a fucking run on it, and dudes like dudes in government are just dopes like us. Except the difference being, they really, 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 really care what people think about them. Because that mm-hmm. is like a politician to me, and there's a couple kinds of politicians, but you know the the kind that is seems to be more prevalent is the kind that is in it for personal prestige and you know look, power. At, look at me, power. You know there mm-hmm. seems to be less and less of the people that are actually trying to make a difference, mm-hmm. and they're kind of beholden to none of them want to be Trump. And and Trump yeah. on a certain level isn't even he's pushing back against COVID. I'll, I'll, I'll give, but he's not pushing back super hard. He's like sure. somewhat doing it in a way to pacify both sides. Yeah, even even exactly. Trump, you know, which which we could which we could probably hold up as the pinnacle of fucking anti-establishment, anti-media. Mm-hmm. Love him or hate him, him sure. and the fucking establishment don't get along, and they like to fight publicly. And he's mm-hmm. you know more apt to to say things that maybe wouldn't have been said said before in that position and and even he can only go so far 
right? And yeah. and and I mean, I would argue that's because he's controlled opposition, and that's that's very much by design. But now take a Justin Trudeau or a Jason Kenney or a guy who, like, I don't think our premier in Alberta could handle going viral and having half the world call them names and everywhere you turn. Like, you need mm -hmm. to be so, so you get stuck in this point where if 60% of the population, and I think it might be more than that. Like, we might, uh, it's hard to tell exactly where the barometer is of where people think on COVID because it seems I to be. I feel like it's half and half it's, in a way. But it's not half and half because it's not just a needle in the middle. It's this weird, like, spectrum there's a like big, autism. There's a, there's a big middle section, I think, that, yeah. that don't really buy it, but they don't really know what and to do, and they haven't really looked into it. it. Yeah. There's different levels of what they're willing to put up with, and it's this this weird sort of spectrum. But I just feel like they're, they're stuck. So if you take that and put all that spectrum together, and the people that are scared are are naturally more vocal about it, and, and the people who aren't are like us, we're bitching about it on the Internet as opposed to you know blowing up the 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 go local government office or the provincial yeah. government not office. blowing it up or, like well, i mean blowing up the phone line yeah you know yeah I mean? Jesus. Like, like freaking out <laughs> you're like, already got us sucked off youtube <laughs> you're already advocating <laughs> violence and we're off i didn't YouTube. mean that i meant blowing up the phone lines yeah. those are the people that are calling in and and even our local people in chestermere said that so many people have have called freaking out about why are isn't everyone wearing masks yeah, yeah. that we feel cornered and that's mm -hmm. because they're the the vocal minority, I would say. Whereas, sure. but that, that doesn't seem to be going away. And those are the people that. So you get this weird thing, and it's like this thing with like the whole world right now, where it seems like everyone's super super divided. But when you actually go out in public, there's a way bigger gray area mm -hmm. than there is on either side of it, right? There's pro COVID, yeah. anti COVID, and there's a bunch of people that are in the middle. And it's just more important that we don't kill each other in the meantime. Absolutely. But the social media posts and the stuff that gets amplified are those are those polars, mm -hmm. polar regions, especially right now the polar regions that are that are going with the narrative. So these Absolutely. these politics, and especially when the corporations start backing them up too. So I mean, I don't know. It's got to be a weird spot. Anyway, the point I'm kind of making around trying to make in a roundabout sort of way is that we've entered this era where where this like the shame affects everybody but i think th these corporations and the pharmaceutical companies are starting to really really ramp that up and it and it can be used there is this side of me that goes with it's all a bunch of nefarious politicians and there's this other side of me that says you know that these premiers and governors not all of them but some of them especially when you get down to mayors and city council members that are freaking the fuck out i mean some of them are probably on some payrolls somewhere, sure. But by and large, most of them can't be. But they still feel cornered to make this position, this 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 decision. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of that is based on, on having our media and our Hollywood. And it's Black Mirror, like you talked about, right? Well, if mm -hmm. anyone hasn't figured it out yet, this is the fucking Black Mirror. Absolutely. And, you know, this is the problem. This is, mm -hmm. and whether it's a roundabout, way that it's actually manipulating us to do things or it's just the fact that all the stuff on here has us hyper aware of what everybody's thinking all the time and i mean it's this weird well, not everybody the minority that's being amplified that's yeah, the problem yeah mm -hmm. like yeah because th those algorithms <clears throat> algorithms are skewed too i mean they're they're meant to be divisively splitting us apart yeah well, even yeah. if they're not meant to do that, they just do that by our yeah. own human nature because sure. we're always going to naturally like things that agree with our outlook on the world. We're going to be friends mm -hmm. with people that agree with, you know, it's just sort of naturally, even without any nefarity in that, that's going to naturally scale out like that, I think, over mm -hmm. time. And I think that this is kind of the culmination of, if you, like, this is my explanation of it without having a crazy Illuminati that, I've heard there very well could be. I'm not ruling yeah, yeah. that out. Like the one world government stuff could be right around the corner as, as well. But the drug companies have really, really, really taken over the place. And like you talk to guys like Dal Bigtree and he'll, you know, it's, it's there. It, all the stuff's there to look at. Like pharma's out lobbying, defense, and I forget the other big one, tech. Those two combined 
Pharma's mm-hmm. still out lobbying them like four or five to one. Oh, yeah. And they've completely taken over all of the networks via drug advertising. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like we're really in that spot now where you have where you can't make a movie or a documentary or say anything on the news negative about a pharmaceutical company or it's over. Yeah. So it's kind of like, I think, I don't know, I go back and forth on whether it's an, all the politicians taking over the place or if it's just a few pharma people and this is their way because if they can get the COVID one mandatory or at least not even mandatory but needed for travel and everything else, mm-hmm. that's just going to open the floodgates. Yep. And the next thing you know, it's going to be, oh, you need the measles too, and you need this year's flu shot, and you need, mm-hmm. and you need, and you need. Because then what they're going to do is they're going to start saying that, they'll start admitting that the measles vaccine is a problem. And that, you know, that actually should be an annual too. Because I think that's yep. where they're headed in this, is they want them all to be annuals. They want them all to be government money so that you know, Darren and Graham don't have to come up with the 400 bucks to get their shot. So it's all guaranteed money. But the hope in that would be that is they don't care that it's, they're not going to be so hard on the mandation part of it because the doses are already sold. And they're making a Mm -hmm. killing. And they're making it with half the people. And they're making a killing with half the people. Well, the governments are going to buy enough doses for everybody. Right, regardless of whether they use them or not. The money's been paid for. I mean, that's what's so frustrating. They've already made made hay through this whole thing. I mean, oh, look yeah. at the billions that you guys have put in Amer- in America. I mean, all the It's insane. And then so but but still getting back to the the bogus stats and the fear point. I mean, that's what makes me think that this is the the great reset and that they know. They know they must know this. Mm-hmm. And either they chose either they chose a really bad one and it's not working as planned and they decide to go ahead with it anyways. Or, or they're um, they're just know how freaking it doesn't matter. They can just push yeah. it out, and it doesn't matter because they know everybody's just going to follow along. So, and they can throw all this symbolism and all this crap in our face, and and say they're going to do it and do the event two hundred one and the decade of vaccines and lockstep and dark winter and. And, uh, you know, the Project Runway with the COVID model with the mask on last year. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're just throwing it in your face because they yep. know it doesn't even matter. They just plow their way through. And they, all these stats are just, it doesn't even matter to them. Yep. Well, I think the Great Reset, as we've discussed, has been going, been planned for a long, long time now. But I think this COVID situation was sort of an experiment. Like, how many hoops can we get? the masses to jump through yeah and i think they've it, they've had such an easy time of it like you when, when do you point, think they realize that i don't know uh maybe very soon maybe a couple of months into it maybe I, like I april know. march april or yeah yeah uh so and not only have people been more than willing to jump through these hoops but then they start being the dogs for the state also they start calling each other out and dividing themselves up and they just kind of just sit back and watch the fireworks so i think because it's been so easy to get people to comply they're like well shit we were going to do this in a couple of years let's just do this now yeah, exactly <laughs> seems seems like the right fucking time to do it and it it is i think it is i think so many people are so so strongly divided i don't know about in canada but in america everything is so politicized we got trump so you know if you question the narrative at all you're automatically a racist trump supporter <laughs> there's no nuance in between those two extremes you know and if you're for masks well then you're a liberal and you're you know you're a hero because you're doing it for other people um i don't know if it's divided along political lines in canada like that but a little bit a little bit a little bit so then you go online and you get people shouting at each other and all that shouting at each other does is solidify both sides so it doesn't there's no conversation there's no exchange there's no nuance there which is exactly what needs to happen so it just further divides people which makes something like this super easy to do, super fucking easy. So once you've got sides, then it's easy. And the majority are the people that comply. Then those are the people that are going to take the jab without a fight at all. And then they're going to help you actually get on the streets and shame everybody else who doesn't go along with the, with the program, you know. 
it's nuts. It's 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 disappointing. I'm disappointed in humanity. Yeah, for, yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, I know their intentions, at least to them, are good. But come on, do some research. Look a little bit under the. But that's that's got a tight seal on it too, because then you're a conspiracy theorist. Yeah. If you question anything at all, then you're a nutcase. You know, for even thinking that. Why would billionaires and a government funded by corporations ever try and fuck us over? <laughs> well, dude, weren't you at the Occupy marches like a few years ago saying, talking about the 5% and stuff like that? These are the same people doing that, you know, like the disconnect is astounding. Uh, yeah, I'm disappointed too. And I don't know what to do pers on a personal level because I don't want to live through the lie, like not mm -hmm. live, but I don't want to participate in it. And it's becoming slimmer and slimmer. You know, it's it's becoming harder and harder to be able to do that already, without For you sure. know, without <clears throat> uh, shooting up a red flag and and making you know. I feel like going around the bullhorn sometimes, or a big sign, <laughs> or a big exactly. sign, or, or a big sign, and just start referencing scientific studies or something yeah. else for people to. But I mean, I like I said, I, I don't think I think we're past the wake up stage. It's just I, it's just how to how to approach it from an authentic level. Like I, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's the thing too. Also, that that is convenient about all this is that we can't congregate in groups in public. So I thought about you know, wouldn't it be interesting to have a to rent a space out, a big space that holds maybe four or five hundred people, and have a debate, have a public debate between both sides and then you know a civil one not a shouting match or anything like that just so both sides can can air their grievances and and point to their charts and stuff like that but you know we can't do that because that's congregating now it's i think we're down to 50 people in my county we're down to 10 what? right now 10 holy yeah. shit wow yeah so that's a great idea but you know who won't debate right you know who won't yeah. open it up and their excuse will be, you can't give them any, you know, any, you can't give them the satisfaction of a conversation or you can't even highlight their side. You know, it's yeah. that, it's that bad that they can't even mm -hmm. debate. But yeah. our, our, our health leader, what's, I don't even know what her title is. The one that does all the conferences. Health on. minister. Is, are the, is she a health minister, minister of, of province health? or? I don't know. Yeah. Anyways, the one that's whispering in the ear of the premier. Mm -hmm. They're going back and forth. There's a big, big uh, controversy over the leak. There's a leak, leak tape of them of him not listening to her advice or something like that. <laughs> so she had to address it, and then that same speech where she addressed it, she talked about the particles being aerosolized. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, this is interesting, because our Alberta, the other official Alberta website, not the other one, the other thing the Alberta website shows is that. It's not proven that masks, wearing masks, stop the virus. Mm -hmm. Protect, it's not proven that wearing masks protect you from the virus, right on the Alberta website. And yet she mentions that these are particleized, and in specific instances, they will travel farther and stay in the air longer, like exercising in a spot, or she tried to make a couple specific instances but my sense was that they're dancing around this trying to say like it's going to be out in the air no matter what whether you're wearing a mask or not because the mask's not going to stop anything if it's aerosolized if it's the droplets and that's <laughs> they're trying to make it about the droplets now so it's gone from the mask is going to protect you to it's going to stop the droplets but now when you look at it, it's just like a filtration of just shooting out all these little <laughs> Small particles like that the mask geyser. doesn't stop anyways, and now they're going to sit in the air for longer because oh they've been God. ejected through this. What was the term that, that I was reading that website? The term about the uh, in, inject ejecting the particles out of a oh, mask? I, I forget. Hyper something or other? Yeah, but it's so it's really, really interesting the way they're dancing around this. Um, Thank God. This aerosolized thing, which uh, it's nuts. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 uh, just another interesting little kind of a side note, but kind of going along with confrontations and stuff like that. I remember hearing on your guys's Pam Popper episode, uh, somebody sent an email about going into maybe it was Whole Foods. For some reason, I was thinking it was Sprouts. Yeah, I don't know if it was Whole Foods either. I think. Yeah. You think it maybe was Sprouts? Yeah. And and the 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 person confronted him and ended up escorting him to the 
the, the cash register or something like that. And he kind of had fun with it. Yeah. Well, I was thinking of that and I'd never, since I decided not to wear a mask, um, I guess maybe I should go into why I stopped wearing a mask. I was at a grocery store checking out, buying groceries for people, because that's what I do in between jobs. And uh, I heard this woman just being very loud and very rude and talking about, well, if you don't have one, you've got to take one. I'd be glad to give you one. And so I turned around and there's this little short woman who works at the grocery store shouting at this dude who didn't look confrontational at all. He kind of had his head down. He was a little timid, but very polite. And uh, she's talking about the mandate and that's the law. And I said, I turned around and I said, it's not, a mandate is not a law. It's more like a suggestion. Uh, there's no cop that's going to come and take this person away because they're not wearing a mask. And, she, and I said, well, what if he's got a medical exemption? Well, he didn't say so. And so she just keeps chattering on at this guy and the guy looks over and says, thank you. And I like, thank you for sticking up to me. And I said, well, how about this? And I took off my mask right in front of her, which totally pissed her off. <laughs> but there was nothing she could do, you know. So I ended up meeting the guy in the parking lot, and he was very thankful. And he did have a, a medical exemption. Uh, he was just too polite to say so. Um, and he ends up, he knows this law firm that's going to sue this corporation. Anyway, so I go into Sprouts. I don't have a mask on. And... Uh, I'd never done this since I decided not to wear a mask. And the little timid person who's like the bouncer outside of Sprouts said, uh, uh, do, you, do you need a mask? And I said, no, I have a medical exemption. That's my loophole. And uh, so she goes, okay. She was kind of nice and polite, but I saw her run to <laughs> another little higher up, <laughs> like, like a little penguin. And uh, so I just, you know, went about my business, started shopping. And um, so the second person who was obviously flustered and did not want to have a confrontation like this said the same thing. And I said, I have a medical exemption. I am shopping. This is what I do for a living. And that's fine. You can call the cops if you'd like, but I'm not going to stop what I'm doing. And so then she runs off like a little penguin to the next person. And she comes at me like a stampeding elephant and said, you know, you've got to get out of the store. Uh, you can't, it's our store policy. You can't have a mask. You, we can't have you shop here. And I said, I'm going to keep shopping. This is what I do for a living. I'm in the middle of buying groceries for somebody. Call the cops. I please, I implore good, good you to you. call the yeah. cops. Yeah. yeah. Because I know I've heard I have somebody who's communicated with the city cops here, and they have no desire. They've, they're never going to answer a call like that. I know that for a fact. And uh, so she said, well, we just won't check you out then. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> She's got me. Checkmate, man. What do, what do I do with just, that? I just can't just walk take out. Take the groceries. <laughs> That's the thing. I was in the middle of a batch shopping for somebody else. I'm like, what the fuck do I do now? You know, like I didn't even have a backup mask on me. So I, she won. I, I, I left and had to go out and figure out how to cancel the patch. But damn, like that's so like to find out that there are stores that don't even have the loophole of being medically exempt. Like what, what, what do those people do? You know, like that's why I decided to stop wearing a mask at that point, because I'm going to stand up for this dude, you know, and my girlfriend is the same way. She's met as a medical exemption. Yeah. Mine too. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, like, but she doesn't even want to do it because she doesn't want to be confronted or she doesn't want to stand yeah. out. I mean, that's the exactly. thing. A lot of these people with exemptions don't want to even disobey. My girlfriend's the same way. She gets yeah. really anxious about yeah. it. Yeah. 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 So it stinks. Like, yeah. And the problem, the see the hard, the really hard time I have with this is that it's just all. My belief is now, and I don't like to be too dogmatic about any belief, but that the that they're just making it worse, and that they've never yeah. worked for this. They say yep. it on the box of the N95s. The cloth yeah. masks do nothing. You can blow all kinds of shit through them. They're not really protecting you. People are touching them all over the place. Yeah. Darren was we were arguing about today or talking about today. Darren was like, "Well, the people are just pulling them out of their." pockets in their car consoles and everywhere and i mean yeah. it's it's just so frustrating that to watch it all fall apart based on what i think is just a big lie you know yep. or at least subjective enough that you could argue that like my argument is even if they did work i don't agree with it 
Yep. Even if the masks work 100%, I don't agree with it because it's not, yeah. we shouldn't be doing any of this stuff. Yeah. It's and not it's not like, anything in the big, big picture. you know, there's microbiologists and doctors and scientists from all over Europe and the States, and they're not getting their voice heard. I mean, how, how can we have so many professionals being censored and nobody even really knows about it? Yeah. The censorship is insidious. It's so insane right now. Yeah. Yeah. People are getting shadow banned and their accounts shut down and suspended. It's left and right. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. weird. If this is such fringe stuff, then why are you guys so worried about exactly. it? Like, <laughs> let the nuts speak, you know? Yeah. Let them have their soapbox in the in this town square. Yeah. Ah, <sighs> nuts. What are, what are we going to do with all this, huh? I don't know, man. I think you got to find your tribe and, and just and talk to your loved ones. Have some real serious conversations with your loved ones about yeah. about. It. I think that's the, I mean, I don't know what else to do to prepare. I mean. Yeah. Yeah, that's. I think that's all you can do. I think that's all you can do in life. It's not like I know people try and. That's why some people get into politics is to try and change the world from a policy point of view or a law point of view. But this, that stuff doesn't stick. You, you got to change from inside first. That's the stuff that sticks. And I think the people that you can most directly affect are the people around you. You know, yeah. or the people in our earshot, or you know. Yeah. I think that's the most surefire thing, somebody that you have a connection with already. Yeah, we just had a great conversation before we recorded this with a, a guy who's uh, he, who helps uh, heal people and train them through awareness of your consciousness. And mm -hmm. it's just sort of what you're talking about, you know, cool. going inside and finding that awareness to heal, you know, whatever, your thoughts, your, your feelings, your, all that stuff. And that, that will resonate. That'll, that'll, you can connect with other people through that metaphysical yeah. awareness. Yeah. I heartedly yeah. agree. Yeah. I think that's why it's really important not to be confrontative. Like, I think Pam Popper said something like, be kind, be right, or something like, be kind first, be right last. Yeah. Like, I think that's important, you know, like, it's, emotional as we all get and puffy chested i think it's easy to push people away if they for some reason blindly talk about wearing masks for instance but i think it's important to not you know not distance yourself from those people and try and understand where they're coming from like give them the benefit that they may not even be giving you yep you know i yeah. agree yeah that's important percent yeah. darren what do you got buddy i i don't have nothing <laughs> nothing <laughs> Needing something? Would you like me to have something? No, no. You're still just like <laughs> what, you haven't had any mask problems lately, anything like that. Mm, well, what did you say? What did you say today? Or, or I think it seems to be getting. It seems to be getting like we used to have. Uh, I think it's getting worse for freedom here. It's 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 at the point now where I think in a couple weeks especially because they warned us that they're going to lock things down even tighter if mm -hmm. people don't comply and nobody's complying or not nobody, but there's never going to be a hundred percent compliant. So they're leaving themselves an out to just shut her down even more. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably what is on Darren's mind. And my mind is that in a couple of weeks, it might be even harder because these people might be more scared and more freaked out. And then I don't know, mm -hmm. then what do you do with your truth? I just bought an Xbox just for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> The new Xbox came out, so the old ones are super cheap. And I was just thinking, <laughs> oh, cool! You can pay that fifteen bucks a month, and you get access to a hundred games or something like that. And I was just mm -hmm. like, you know what? If we can't leave the fucking house all winter, <laughs> we're gonna need something to do. It's getting a little cold to be out hunting and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So you run into that real problem of if nothing's open, there's really not much to do out of the fucking house. Yeah. We'll get sure. some Chinooks and stuff, though. But it is, it's getting to that season where we can't just go out hunting all day because it's, you know, fucking cold and wintry. Yeah. And you can only do yeah. so much work on the podcast and books and stuff. I mean, you got to have some entertainment in there. Yeah, oh, yeah. You got to do something. You're just going to fall right into the technocratic tra trap. You're going to be like, <laughs> just pay me my UBI and let me sit there and play these games. And Oh, you're way closer to that than I am. <laughs> Uh, probably. <laughs> yeah. Well, are we rounding up on an hour? Here? I think so. Yeah. What do you got mm -hmm. coming up? Like, what are you, what are some of your plans for your show? Uh, let's see. Who do I got coming up? I, actually, Friday I'm interviewing uh, Kimmy Robertson from Twin Peaks. 
wow. the secretary in Twin Peaks. Yeah, awesome. to see if she has any freaky stories about uh, being on set and working with David Lynch and wow. all that crazy really? universe. One of my favorite shows. I don't know if, if you guys are familiar with that. When that comes out, send me a link because I got a lot of a yeah. lot of friends that are into Twin Peaks, but I never end up cool. watching it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just interviewed a guy named Christopher Bache who uh, wrote a book on inner traditions, LSD, and the universal mind, and he, uh, through a course of twenty years, had seventy three. He went through it by Stanislav Grof's uh, protocols. Yeah. 73 super duper intense acid experiences and all of this crazy stuff that he called from it it's really amazing it's it's one of those it's as i say in the intro to the podcast it hasn't come out yet but um hearing him speak is kind of like i used to get listening to old terence mckenna tapes like wow. you just get into an altered state of mind just like contemplating all the stuff that he's talking about so that's great uh the episode that's coming out next is uh, Joshua Kutchin and Timothy Renner talking about their Bigfoot book. I don't know if you guys know about that. I heard a little bit about it, I think, yeah. Where yeah. the Footprints End. Yeah. Great, great fucking book. So that's some of the stuff that's coming up. Awesome. Yeah, what about you guys? Well, we got one coming up with uh, how to, how to uh, what do you call it? Soil brew, uh, your own mushrooms. Uh, and concentrate on fucking Minecraft vids, I think, or Fortnite <laughs> or something. I mean, these <laughs> kids are making, are killing. I could get excited and rant and rave. I think I could do it. Yeah, for sure. Oh, my God. These guys <laughs> are like, everything's got to be over the top all the time. Uh -huh. Really? Is that, yeah, well, we, why don't you try it on the show first? <laughs> and then you can take it to your little games. Do what? Get over the your top. little games. Over the top. Dry America is not an over the top show, bro. That would just ruin everything. Can you imagine if I just started being over the top all of a sudden? We're gonna hey. talk about cult we're gonna talk about culti hey, cultivating uh, cultivating your own shrooms. Little oh, kits. Cool. Yep. Nice. That's coming up next week. And then Freedom for Canada. We're hoping to get them on too. And then uh there's just too many. There, honestly, I was just telling Darren before we started recording, it's overwhelming with mm -hmm. just scheduling and the amount of people that we want to talk to and the amount of people that really seem to want to talk to us. It's just yeah, no more. It's amazing. This is yeah. the last one. We got one coming out that hasn't been released yet. That's uh, First We Eat, and it's about a family up in northern BC, like or no, no, sorry, Yukon. northern U uh, northern Canada in Yukon, mm -hmm. 300 kilometers from the, the Arctic Yukon. Circle, the Yukon. <laughs> and uh, they went a year eating locally, like oh, within nice. this nice little uh, radius of their town in the middle of nowhere. So it was cool. really tough through the winter. They had to stock all this food. It was a fantastic huh? documentary of this family that oh, did great. that. So that's coming out uh, as well soon. And Jamie Janover is coming out. And we have Adam it's Apollo coming, coming on as it's well. today. Uh, Adam Apollo. Cool. So those guys are kind of Resonance Foundation guys, kind of like the, uh, <laughs> or you know, tomorrow. the... The magician, the the uh, you know the wizards of the you know Nassim Harriman world. Uh huh. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Fantastic wizards? stuff. Yeah. What wizards? Yeah, Adam's That's a wizard. What you yeah. With? yeah. Okay. Adam says he's a wizard. Okay. Jamie is more of like an artist musician, I would say. But mm -hmm. but you know. Cool. But the way Jamie Great. put the way Jamie put into terms about how to to resonate. And how you, how, how you, it's like after all these years, and we talked to him like three times, but he explained how when you're resonating in a higher vibration, how you'll notice something or notice people or notice opportunities and mm -hmm. how you can sort of perpetually keep that, that going. Yeah. It was the one yeah. that really clicked for me the way he explained it. So cool. Yeah. That's some good yeah. stuff. It, you can really tell your state of mind when you, in what you pick out in other people, you know? Yeah. If yeah. you're in an enlightened state, you can see everybody is that way. If you're in a crummy state of mind, everybody seems grumpy and grimy and yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, yeah. Grimy? It makes, really, bro? That's, <laughs> that's the word <laughs> I'm not good at drawing words out of the air. Grimes, well, I'll, I'll, I'll edit. Grimes. You know, Grimes. I think he's probably been called grimy his whole life. So, sons of bitches. <laughs> All right, guys, we hope you enjoyed the podcast. Is that hey, what you, want? you want some of that? Yeah, go over the top. More yeah. of that. Hey. Well, was, yeah, this has been a blast, man. Uh, we Likewise. should do it again. Yeah, do it Absolutely. again. Absolutely. I bet I can for sure. An arm wrestle. <laughs> 
Yeah, thank you. I've, I can't really say thank you for coming onto my show because we're kind of simultaneously on each other's show. But yeah, this has been great. The first time I've ever done this, so I can't think of two better chaps to do it with. Awesome, right on. Well, yeah. We're glad to, to right pop pop your Swapcast cherry. That. We've done that. We've, we've popped a couple Swapcast cherries, I think. You guys are old pros. Yeah. Old dirty man <laughs> popping cherries. You're the doms. <laughs> oh. That's what I no. like about them high school girls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dirty Graham and grimy Darren. Yeah. So, <laughs> me out of the <laughs> Dirty Graham, DG. There you go. Grimy Darren, GD. There we go. All right, buddy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good to see Take you. Take care, guys. Yeah. All right. Yes, Ciao. let's do it again soon. Okay. See ya. Farewell. And that was our chat with Dirty Mike and the boys. Just kidding. The Melt cast. Melt. The Melt. The Melt. Yeah. Yeah, great podcast. It's got that professional sound too, like the NPR kind of edited together nicely. Top. And no, <laughs> no, not quite over the top. <laughs> but yeah, good. Under the top. Just well massaged. Just right out yeah, the top. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, we hope you enjoyed our swap cast cherry busting extravaganza. Uh, if you're getting some value from these podcasts delivered to your phone or your black mirror device. Uh, send a little value back our way. You can pop on that black mirror. Go to grandamerica.ca slash support. Sign up for a monthly or one-time donation. Be fabulous. Listen, if you're on Stripe, you got to check it or switch to PayPal or something. The Stripe ain't working great. I'm getting emails from people saying it's not a problem on their end, but the payments aren't going through. So... If your payment's not going through and you want to just go to PayPal or try regenerating it, if you email me, I can cancel that for you so you can remake a new one. But I think our Skype monthlies are failing at like a 75% rate right now. So if you're on Stripe, take a look. Email me if you want to figure that out. We love you. GrabMarket.ca slash support. If you're getting some value from the show, guys, you're all we got. The only way the show exists is if you guys hit america.ca slash support there's also the melt podcast the link will be in the show notes check that stuff out do all the stuff in the show notes join the chat there's a thousand crazy motherfuckers in there america.ca slash chats i think it's like a thousand and subscribe on youtube if you want we're almost there. we're almost at ten thousand we don't really want to get to ten thousand but let's linger around nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine for as long as possible just in case nine point six seven yeah and thanks to everybody for watching and listening that's it we love you Thanks for listening. We will see you next week. All right, we can shut this shit down. Yeah, we got thanks for watching everybody. All Live right. guys. Really appreciate it. Love you all. We'll see you next see week. See in the chats. See you next week. See you in the chats. <laughs> oh, that doesn't shut it off.